Okay, welcome to another episode of Morelia Python Radio. And in this episode, it's kind of a special episode as far as I'm concerned because we started this podcast, Owen, back in 2011. Jesus Christ. <laughs> there were certain species that were... Um, unbreedable, you know, unobtainable. Unbreedable, yeah. unattainable. Never, never going to happen. It was a yeah, pipe dream. And yeah. So many different theories on how to breed these rare, uh, hard to breed species. And, you know, a few people sort of, uh, uh, you know, sort of, uh, went into, uh, um, went into those projects and, you know, put their all into it. And, uh, we have one of those gentlemen here tonight. <laughs> Mr. Shane Adamson is here to, uh, to talk to us about breeding Halmahara scrub pythons and, I remember back in the day, there was this thing that you had to keep them hotter than pythons and you regular pythons and, you know, they needed, uh, you know, constant humidity and because Halma hair was so wet. I remember reading on the MP forums about how, you know, Halma hair is like drenched in rain and mm-hmm. all the time, which is, I think Birdsboro PA gets more rain than uh, mm-hmm. Halma hair. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. Probably. Well, especially recently, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This year I can... <laughs> totally say yes but yeah yeah and it's just one of those things where sometimes it was a theory sometimes it was a theory based in kind of fact and other times it was people were just throwing jello at the wall and saying that's how you breed helms and it's like but like did it work no so it was one of those things where obviously it was going to take a bunch of people really sticking to the project and really trying and it wasn't going to be a quick simple read it with your eyes closed like a corn snake kind of a project. So, yeah. yeah. So to date, I believe it's, uh, you know, I think Blake at the uh, Oklahoma Zoo was the Mm. first to breed them in captivity. Um, I think after that was Chuck Poland. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a guy in Europe. I can't remember his name, but uh, there there was a guy in Europe. I want to say his Reptil, reptil. Uh, man, I'm I'm drawing a blank on the name. Anyway, okay. um, so and then there's Shane. Shane. Just produced them this year. So yeah. welcome to NPR, man. How you doing, Shane? It's uh, uh, glad yeah. to have you, man. Um, I'm honored to be here. I've <laughs> listened to probably well. I know I've listened to every podcast uh, since it started. Kind of came in from uh, out of BT. Who were the yeah. original her podcast? Oh yeah, mm-hmm. Reptile Radio. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, so it kind of picked up with you guys after they started dropping off. So, right on, cool. So, um, we usually ask everybody when it's their first trip here. You know, uh, kind of give us a little bit of an overview, like wh- what got you into reptiles in the first place. Um, well, it's probably about the same. Well, it's kind of the same as everyone else. I always had kind of a uh, thing for animals, reptiles, dinosaurs, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, The funny thing is my mom kind of made me scared of snakes. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. So when I was a kid, I would, we lived in this big old house and snakes would get in there and my stepdad would kill them. And I was deathly afraid it would give me nightmares. And, uh, but I always, you know, if we went to a toy store, I always got a rubber snake or a rubber alligator or something like that. So uh, anyway, um, you know, fast forward to fourth grade, we moved to Lawrence, Kansas. And, um, you know, KU's there. There's a natural museum of history there that has a display of snakes. And uh, I met a kid named Matt, and he and I became very fast friends. And he mm-hmm. actually collected snakes and did some herping. And we used to go to Clinton Lake there by Lawrence and collect snakes and anything else we could find and turtles and stuff. So that so kind of we'll, is kind of we'll where it started. I always like to be outside. Um, my mom actually, during the summer when she would come home from work, would uh, be afraid to look in my bedroom or the bathroom <laughs> because uh, what was there? Well, one time yeah. my sister was taking a shower in her bathroom and <clears throat> my mom asked why she wasn't taking a shower in the other bathroom. And it's because I had three giant snapping turtles in the bathtub. <laughs> she said, well, Shane's got some turtles in there. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> yeah, there were some other things with, you know, she'd come home and I'd have garter snakes, but I've always had um, newts, salamanders. Um, I've tried to keep snakes and stuff when I was a kid, um, but mostly what I was allowed to keep was newts, salamanders. My mom actually bought me a caiman one time when wow. I was in high school. Yeah. Um, so that, anyway, as I grew up, my mom, mm. I, you know, could see that I had an affinity for, you know, animals or whatever. And she happened to know someone that worked at the Topeka zoo and they had an explorer program there. Uh, explorer program is a program for teenagers through the boy scouts that kind of allows them to see what it's like to work in different fields, whether it be aviation, um, law enforcement, uh, veterinary, zoo field. And so in 1985, when I was 14 or 15 years old, I became an explorer scout there at the Topeka Zoo. And that was probably, uh, if there's any days I could go back within my life, it would be those <laughs> days. It was probably the most amazing time in my life. And um, so from 85 to 90, 1990, I was an explorer scout. And then 1990, I became a full-time keeper there at the Topeka Zoo. Um, so I've worked with uh, everything from alligators, uh, West African dwarf crocodiles, uh, gharials, um, cool, Burmese pythons. Back in those days, I did a lot with poison dart frogs um, mm. in the early 90s. So, and that was still pretty new. Um, uh, just, you know, give an opportunity at the zoo to do a lot of things, meet a lot of people. Um, I met, uh, you know, speaking of monitor lizards, like we were talking about before, I went to Northern California for a reptile um, symposium. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking to a gentleman and he's like, oh, you're from Kansas. You know, he said I did some stuff at KU and uh, we went out and had coffee and ice cream and stuff after the, the one of the symposiums and had no idea who he was. And it turns out it was uh, Robert Sprackland who <laughs> wrote the giant lizards book in, book. Back yeah. in the early nineties. And uh, he and I have talked, you know, over the years since then. That's but anyway, awesome. that's kind of where it started. And uh, in 1994, my collection at my home was, more diverse than at the zoo. And, uh, I had two little kids and I was a single dad and I had to kind of get a job making more money than the zoo could pay me. And I mm. figured, you know, I can take care of reptiles at home, uh, and get a regular job. So that's what I did. All um, right. So what, what led to scrubs and how my hair is like, what kind of brought you right back to that thing? Well, uh, so the first pythons that I ever produced were D. Albert's pythons in 1998. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Because <laughs> I've been screwing yeah. around with them for years and can't get nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, man, I wish I could tell you what I did because, to be honest. <laughs> uh, so do I. Yeah. <laughs> so <it's... laughs> um, I just, I got them from uh, Don Soderberg in Wichita who uh, he's the palmetto corn snake guy or founder. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, anyway, I had gotten them in 1997. They were wild caught, a wild caught pair. Uh, they were the, the Southerns or the golds or I'm sorry, the Northerns, Northerns, Northerns. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. I thought, well, it's getting cool. And all the other snakes are kind of, acting like they want to. And I put them together and they bred and it was pretty much textbook or clockwork, I guess you could say. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's kind of, you know, back in the early two thousands, I was like everyone else. And I was kind of chasing the ball Python thing. So most of my collection was ball pythons or boas. And I thought morphs were the end all beat all. <clears throat> uh, once I started producing stuff like that, mm -hmm. I, um, realized I really didn't find, how do I say it? I enjoy breeding any kind of snake um, and working with any kind of snake, but I didn't want to continue to contribute to 
you know, putting more morphs out there. Um, mm. And the different stuff just kind of, I don't know. I don't know how you say it. Um, made me work harder. More appealing. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. It was a challenge. Right. Right. Yeah. I like it. I mean, because <laughs> every, it, it, everybody, you know, you can have the easy stuff and the racks and stuff, but then every once in a while you want one that, if it breeds, it's a big deal. You know, it's, I can understand that. Well, I, I and, you. you know, and I really changed about, I don't remember when it was, probably 2008 or 2009. Uh, I bred uh, Brettles pythons for the first time. Um, nice. And I had bred a few ball pythons and stuff. And I found out that I really didn't want to become a, a breeder to the point that I'm selling, that I wanted to be a breeder <laughs> that I enjoyed. Why are y'all laughing? Because that's, well, we've had that conversation. Cause that's, <laughs> I know. that's eventually, <laughs> cause that's me. <laughs> cause that's him. Yeah. Like, you know, that's where I'm at at this point where I'm like, yeah. eh, like we all want somebody just to, to handle that part of the thing for us. And yeah. Uh, Though I can keep playing with my snakes and breathing, you know. It's, yeah. yeah. So that's so just things that appeal to me is the direction that I have gone over the last mm -hmm. uh, 10, 12 years, maybe. Okay. And uh, what's the collection look like now? Um, have the helms, obviously, um, mm -hmm. rough scale pythons. Um, I have, right? <laughs> So the yep. two adult <laughs> rough scale pythons that I have are the uh, uh, roughies for Rico snakes. Yeah, I won, yeah. I, I was them in the gonna auction. ask about those. Yeah, those are the first rough scales I ever saw and held. Yeah. But you know, I might have gone a little crazy over your babies when they were like within my <laughs> oh, area. Oh wow! Yeah. So How I remember. Cool I remember you won those because I, I yeah, that was you, awesome. You. You were bidden over the phone, right? Like, yeah, because yeah. Julie was, Julie. yeah, yeah through, okay, through Julie. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, very um, cool. It was kind of funny because, oh. you know, the numbers were going up, and I was just like, I'm not messing around. And I said, This is what I want to buy them for. And I didn't hear anything. <laughs> you know, the guy said my number, and he, I didn't hear anything. And I was like, What happened? And he goes, I don't know. Everybody's just looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, Oh, you won. I was like, yeah, all right, cool. well, because I, like I, I weighed in there and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to put $1,200 down and then it got blown out of the water so quickly. I'm like, never mind. So, you know, and yeah, it was, it was, it happened quick. Well, the, you're right. You weren't messing around. No, the thing is I, I had just contacted Cam to get a pair right before mm -hmm. he put those up for the auction for Rico. And, mm -hmm. um, I had contacted him before and he's like, yeah, I got a couple pairs. And I said, okay, I kind of got to get some money together. So I said, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll, you know, let you know. And it was a couple weeks later before I could get that kind of money together. Um, and, uh, he was out of them. And then yeah. you guys announced the, the pair. And I was like, well, I've got the money, so I'm going to go for it. <laughs> I know where they're at. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Yeah, and that's and that was cool cuz and and I'm and I'm definitely glad you still have them and that they've oh, yeah. you know, they've produced for you and stuff of like that for you. So yeah. it hasn't that's been cool. we can talk about that later, but it hasn't been yeah. the most successful uh project that I've worked with. And mm. um you know that we can talk about that later, but uh to move on through the collection, I also have yeah. a couple green tree pythons, nothing significant. Um savu pythons. Nice. Um which I've been really su successful with those. Um, and those are, again, kind of one of those snakes that when I got them back in 2012, everyone at the show, so I got them from a, a Stephen Bostwick out of Iowa, and I had met him previously a few other times. And I'm walking along the table and I'm looking at all the snakes and, you know, what everybody has. And there's two little deli cups with these two Savu pythons. And I look down and I look at him and I look at him. And I said, are those Savu pythons? This was 2012. He goes, yep. And I was like, I want those so bad. <laughs> and the price on them then would make you sick today. I because I think I got a Savu python in 2012. So I think I, yeah. yeah it, they were, Yeah, it's like ring python stuff where you're like, it was giving away. And now it's. Yeah. 
Yeah. So fortunately, um, shortly after that, Bob Clark had a clutch that mm. produced some babies that were kind of purple or lavender when they came out. So I have two of those animals as well. Uh, two females. Any difference between the adults when they got older? Well, no. They, they turned okay. orange after they hatched. Uh, the only <laughs> difference in those two versus the two that I got from uh, Stephen is they're still pretty orange. They're not as black as the other ones. So um, cool. But the bad thing is they breed, but they don't lay eggs. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> kind of still working. Crap. For that. <laughs> yeah, you need that second step. Uh, but. So yeah, I still have quite a few ball pythons. Um, maybe 12 or 13 and most of them are at least 20 years old if not older uh, because wow. i can't bring myself to get rid of an animal that i've had so long um, yeah i have that problem <laughs> so, uh, i have some haitian boas um, i've had one litter of those i'm getting ready to have another litter um, nice I'm not sure why I'm doing that to myself because <laughs> Oh, and you know with the Dominican red boas. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Dominican red mountain boas and but all that fun stuff. I have a yep. I'm a glutton for punishment for little brown snakes that like to eat lizards. Yeah, I it's <laughs> like I and I I got the mad hogs and I'm like we're right back where we it, it's like they're the boas. We're right back where the boas. I'm wrapping a pinky in gecko skin and i'm like i why do i do this to myself <laughs> exactly <laughs> like, you know i could just pick something easy but there's so, yeah. there is nothing like the feeling when you've been beating this snake to death with a lizard or lizard scented <laughs> pinky and one day that snake takes the pinky and wraps it up and eats <laughs> It is a good feeling, right? (laughs) I'll take my wife to dinner every time that happens. That's that's a celebration right there. Yeah, that that's That's one of those. That's a fist bump moment. That's a you know. uh, Um, Yeah. What else? Oh, then I also have two point two the Kandoy Australis. Um, Okay. Thought I was going to get a litter this year. I'm not so positive about it now. Um, just kind of looking at uh, she looks so different from the years before when she looked like she was going to go but now it looks like she's just going back to her normal size not building follicles or but I did catch copulation so step in the right direction yeah who knows who knows maybe next year so Um, oh and then I have a 33 year old stink pot turtle (laughs) <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, it's that what random is a thing at the end of turtle? Stink, uh, turtle. <laughs> uh, a musk turtle. Oh okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I I got him. Was it back in 1989? And uh, he's made it through everything with me. He lives outside in the summer, and then I bring him into the snake room in the winter, and he just kind of hangs Jesus. out. And, <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah cool. um, that's awesome yeah i think that's it oh, i do have a, a male timor and a female um uh jungle carpet that i don't have a lineage on her but i have a story that um she's a limkey line striped jungle from um oh cool nice oh i knew i was gonna forget the guy's name Southern California, uh, or San Diego, uh, Sipperly, Gary Sipperly. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Is where her lineage is from. Now, I'm not sure if her as an individual animal is from him or her parents were. Um, she came to me oh, okay. through uh, okay. Miles Exotics and uh, Pet World in Lawrence, Kansas. They did a lot of reptile stuff, um, different shows, and that's where. That's where they got her from is Gary Sipperly. So, okay. but she's cool. just become sort of a hang around pet. And then, <laughs> yeah, I lost uh, both my Brettles pythons this year. Uh, one to a, oh, yeah, one to an aneurysm. The male found him, couldn't move the back half of his body. I thought he'd broken his back and uh, we went in and Shit. made the decision to put him down and did a necropsy and, uh, she said he had it. What had happened is the aneurysm blew out in his aorta and 
cut off the blood flow to the lower half of his body. And that's why he couldn't um, move. And it, it actually clotted. And that's why he didn't die from it. Um, but it, uh, Wow. Yeah. So, and then the female, I think she must have had some, she kind of stopped eating and rapidly went down. And I found a lump in her abdomen. And I'm wondering if she mm. had some sort of a tumor. I didn't get her necropsy. Tumor. Yeah. Yeah. They were both about 20, well, 21 years old now. So wow. it's one of those weird things where it's like, I, I think I've lost more Morelia to cancer than I ever thought I would possibly have to. And then some liasses too, where it's like the necropsy comes and they just have tumors all over their liver or something else like that. And it's, yeah, it the happens. male did have some spots on his liver, but they weren't cancerous. Mm -hmm. Um, and she said it didn't look like, uh, like a fatty liver thing. And we didn't really do the, uh, pathology report. We just did a gross necropsy. Um, mm -hmm. so she didn't, mm -hmm. now she may have just for her own curiosity, but, um, I was surprised looking at the necropsy photos, how, you know, he was a, a very lean looking snake, um, but he mm -hmm. had lots of, uh, fat pockets or, you know, fat within yeah. the body cavity itself. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when you look at a snake and it looks that muscular and lean, you wouldn't think there'd be that much fat in it. Right. Yeah. They seem to just build it up regardless. So, yeah, I think uh, I always think of that uh, picture that Matt Somerville posted up where he mm -hmm. had that, uh, uh, was it a brown snake, I think, of some species of brown snake, but it ate like two mice in the year. And it still had fatty tumors. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Crazy. But yeah. <clears throat> cool. So do you have a favorite in the collection? Is it the hounds? <laughs> it has to be. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Till they bite yeah. you. Yeah, I mean <laughs> the hounds, but I would have to say um, I would say the hounds. But as far as you know, the ruffies, I just can't really beat them because um, if they know you're not feeding them, they're extremely inquisitive and they they really I don't even know how to explain it. They you know they just they come out and they want to cruise around. Mm -hmm. Helms are a lot more uh, reclusive, uh, a lot more defensive, but I pay attention to them more or watch them more and, you know, notice what they're doing or pay attention to what they're doing more. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's hard to pick a, a favorite. <laughs> yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's I, the true thing. Yeah. Okay. okay. Let's get into some hound talk. Um, so, what size group are you working with? Like, uh, so right now I have um, one point two. Okay. Um, the so the male that I have I got in September of two thousand fourteen. Okay. And um, the female I have I got her in February of two thousand sixteen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the other female I have, I just got in 2019. Um, so in 2019, I was diagnosed with, uh, lymphoma mm -hmm. and <laughs> right before they told me that I had lymphoma, I got this, uh, other helm, you know, thinking, you know, I deserve it, you know, whatever. Right. <laughs> anyway, Present for me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So anyway, that's what I'm working with right now. Um, the 2019 animal took about two years to get to even eat on her own. Oh, was it a wild? Were all, were all these wild caught animals or? Oh yeah, okay. yeah. She's a. Uh, uh, she was about four and a half feet long. Okay, so when all she got here pretty much adult, yeah, sub adult so, when you got them. Okay, yes, at least. Um, so she is not in any breeding part of the breeding yet at all mm. not been introduced at all um <clears throat> the female that did produce the eggs when she came in she was very thin she was about 700 grams and probably at least six feet long Jeez. 
And Christ. I know she was uh, super wild caught because her first fecal had a stick in it. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, the male, I actually got the male. I had got two males at one time. And uh, so the male, when I got him, Cam sent them to me. And he, I don't, he probably just opened the box, made sure they were alive and sent them on. Cause they were still in the same bags from Indonesia, from the exporter in the same box. Wow. Um, so they were very fresh. Um, that's nuts. But yeah, that's what I'm working with right now is just the three adults. And, so. and you got a ton of babies that you're working with right now. <laughs> yeah, six, 3.3. Okay. Nice. Not the bad oh, ratio. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> now, there's an asterisk for that. The 3.3 is there are three definite males and three females that when I popped them, I didn't see anything. <laughs> okay. So okay. I'm giving myself about a 95% accuracy rate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It, yeah. <laughs> You know, with me, with hounds, every time I got them, they would do good up until a point, and um, then they seemed to crash. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know. Uh, I had one that lasted a long, long time, but I could never sort of get the stars to align where I had a male and a female. Um, you know, did you go through that kind of, you know, hounds seem to be that one that's kind of up and down. You know, you get them, you get them going, and, you know, next thing you know, you're like, Oh man, <laughs> you know, did you have that experience as well? Um, no, no, actually I did. Nice. Um, well, so I guess you could kind of say I did. I'm not sure because like we were talking before about the female that bred in 2018, mm -hmm. um, she bred and then she stopped eating and then got some sort of kidney infection oh, or something. Mm -hmm. She started, you know, she stopped eating. She started excessively expelling urates and urinating. So mm. I took her to my vet. He ran a bunch of tests, couldn't find any, anything wrong with her. And <clears throat> I tried to keep her going as long as I could, you know, even tube fed her a couple times, the, um, reptilinks, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, quail or whatever I could get into her. And so I got her in 2015. So shot, I had her for three years. Mm-hmm. And she, you know, like I said, she bred with the male that got, I got babies from in 2018, but something happened and she passed away. Yeah. So yeah. what it was, I don't know if it was as a result of the breeding, mm -hmm. um, uh, or something that she had had that she carried over from when she was imported gotcha. uh, because she also, she also took 18 months to get her to eat. And once she did, she started, she would nail rats, you know, right off the tongs, which none of them do that when they first start eating. It's usually drop fed okay. on yeah. the floor of the enclosure. Now all of them take uh, right off the tongs. You know, they're like, you know, I walk in the room right now, the male, when I walk in the room, he's got his head out, especially at night. Right. Yeah. Right. So, Well, that's good. Because no. typically they're sort of shy, um, secretive. I, I don't know what the right word is, but stressed easy. Um, yeah, yeah, they're they're pretty shy. Um, so in total, kind of getting back to you know the losses in total, I've had two point three from two thousand fourteen okay. to two thousand nineteen that came in wild adults. The other male I had was absolutely a mistake on my part and I still feel mm. bad about it. He got in contact with the ceramic heat emitter in his enclosure and it, mm -hmm. it, it burned him and took him to the vet, uh, started some antibiotics and stuff and it just couldn't be, we couldn't reverse it. Um, and I think he basically passed away from some sort of secondary infection from this, the burn mm. that he got. Gotcha. So, Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so those are the two losses that I've had from adults that uh -huh. were imported. Uh, one of them, we obviously know why. The other one, we're not. Sh I don't know a hundred percent. But they were right. years after I'd had them. Right. So. so let's walk through that process when you get them in. Like, what's your approach to getting them? 
quarantine so set up, settled. getting them comfortable, yeah. you know, when, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the first two males that I got were the first that I ever had. Um, I set them up in large, uh, what are they, like Christmas tree, like 30 inch long, 17 mm-hmm. inch tall, the 15 inch wide tubs, uh, mm-hmm. with, with belly heat, kind of a makeshift quarantine rack system. Um, <clears throat> every helm I've gotten has had the, um, the M word mites. Um, yeah, yeah. It's just, <laughs> so yeah. that's, you know, uh, the, uh, the mite medication is on standby the second I'm opening the boxes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's, yep. Uh, that's, yep. Yeah. And then the boxes I, are purged from the house. Yep. <laughs> I, I use, I use frontline, mm-hmm. um, to okay. pre- pre-treat the enclosure. Um, I used to, you know, put it on a paper towel and let the alcohol evaporate off a little bit and then let the snake run through my hands. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that's really necessary, especially with the hounds. I noticed on the two males when I did it, their skin is a little bit uh, thin, you know, like a tropical snake. Mm-hmm. And it seemed to dry their skin out pretty good uh, when I did mm-hmm. that. Okay. So I, I kind of stopped doing that because honestly, if the mites on the snake and the snakes in the enclosure and the enclosure is treated, you know, it's, it's going to take care of them. And then I followed, you know, follow that up with another treatment in two weeks um, to so, kill anything that may have. So what do you do? Just wipe down the enclosure? You're wiping down the whole thing or you, what do you, uh, what's your approach? Uh, spray down the enclosure and the and, uh, paper. I use, you know, paper for quarantine animals mm-hmm. uh, and I'll just let it dry. And then um, I'll put the animal in that after it's been, after it's dried, Um, so I guess I should back up a little bit. So when they first get here and I put them in their enclosure, Mm -hmm. I give them as much fresh water as they can drink. And then the treatment comes after they've had a couple days of, uh, refilling fresh water every time. Cause they'll drink, you know, I think if I remember right, every snake that I've ever gotten or every helmet I've ever gotten has drank fresh water almost immediately, you know, right in front of me, or even if I've come down later in the evening to check on them. Mm -hmm. Uh, So anyway, uh, yeah, then the the mite treatment is kind of after I know they've gotten uh, fresh water. And the only reason I do that is because I remember someone saying that, you know, their, uh, I think it was a veterinarian friend of mine said that from importation, their kidneys can just get completely annihilated because yeah. who knows when the last time they had a drink of water was right. Um, you know, and maybe, maybe that's not the right thing to do, but it seems to have worked. Um, and then I don't let them have water while I'm treating them for mites, especially if I've rubbed it on their skin, because I don't want mm-hmm. them to be able to ingest it right um, mm-hmm. from the water. And there was a veterinarian, I think his name was, uh, shoot. I can't remember his name now. There's a veterinarian that talked about if you find mites, that this is how you should treat it. Remove the water bowl, mm. you know, give them the water bowl a couple days later and then treat them two weeks later again. Mm. Yeah. So that's kind of what I based it off of. Okay. And Anything I use, else you kind of do for them to kind of try to get them settled a little bit faster? Uh, no, I really just leave them alone. Yeah, um, it's probably yeah. best. <laughs> I don't, uh, so the area that I would set them up in for quarantine is like our living room downstairs. It's obviously mm-hmm. not, you know, my main snake room. Um, and it didn't get utilized a whole lot. So they really had just time to, for, to themselves to not be bothered. Um, and if I did check on them, I was tried, you know, tried to be pretty, uh, stealthy about it. Um, when I did get the first males, um, after about, I think a week, maybe two weeks, they mm-hmm. dropped, they ate, they both ate rats right off the bat, um, and never stopped. Uh, the only time, the only time the, this male that I got, uh, babies from ever stopped eating was when he was pursuing the female this year. Uh, he, okay. yeah, he pretty much has never gone off food. Right. Uh, but that being said, it was always 
put the rat in the enclosure, walk away, come back the next day, it's gone. Now he's taken rats right off the tongs. And, okay. you know, oh, so anyway, uh, so I did run uh, fecal exams on the animals and took them to my vet. Um, mm-hmm. And I think the two males that I first got had uh, oh, shoot. Whip, whipworms or pinworms. I can't remember which one it was, but we Ooh. treated with fipronil, okay. um, which is also uh, sold over the counter goat dewormer. Um, but again, they, that being said, I was going off the guise of my veterinarian, a trained veterinarian of how to treat them. Mm-hmm. So I didn't just go grab goat dewormer and shove it down the throat. <laughs> this <laughs> he, ought to be enough. Like, yeah, yeah, no, it's, exactly. Uh... <laughs> he, he actually called K state and um, kind of consulted with their exotic animal vets there. And, uh, and, you know, he called me back and said, this is what we're going to do. So that's what cool. we did. Okay. Um, other than that, uh, just to get them going, you know, like I said, uh, when they first come for the first few months, I change their water a lot just to make sure they always have fresh water. Um, if they're eating, just kind of step back and, and let it go. So, go away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the best thing to do is go away. Yeah. yeah. And the female that, the female that laid eggs and had the babies this year, when I got her, like I said, she was super skinny. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to say on the verge of death, but, uh, she actually ate the first time I offered for her too. uh, she ate a, a, a rat pup, um, so there's three animals that I didn't have any problems with feeding and two animals that took one took 18 months and the other one t- took two years to get to eat. What's the uh, average two full years without eating? Yeah. No, she took two years to take food. Okay. Oh, okay. I, okay. T- I tube fed her. So this is the other female that I have now. Mm-hmm. I tube fed her um, Reptilinx. Okay. Um, with some other okay. supplements in them. Uh, at least every three weeks, maybe a month. It was a very messy process. Um, And I can't even tell you what made it happen other than I had a chick in my freezer and I thought, what the hell, we'll give it a try. And I took the chick and I put it on top of her enclosure next to the ceramic heat emitter. And I came in an hour later after the chick had thawed and she's staring at the top of the enclosure and I thought, well, that looks good. So I opened the door and she, she nailed it, ate it. The next day she ate two more chicks. And then after that, she just nails rats. Nice. So, okay. you know, I couldn't what, what, say, what, couldn't say what it was, but. What size something. food do you give these kind of guys? Like, I mean, are, are we going smaller, better for these guys or is a small or medium rat kind of okay with them? Well, um, for that individual, since she hasn't really been eating, I'm going like a 150 gram rat. Um, and that's, I guess you could probably say a medium ish size rat. Okay. Um, the other animals that I have, I might go a little bigger, maybe a 250 gram rat, nothing. So I've given them jumbo size rats before Mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to bother them. But they're such a slender snake, it just looks ridiculous and it concerns me. So <laughs> I usually yeah. stay on the smaller side, um, uh, smaller side, maybe 250, 300 grams. And that's still kind of a large rat, a large rat. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I kind of, so Nick Mutton said one time we actually, without knowing it, we cycle feed animals. You know, Mm -hmm. because we know the breeding season's coming and we start throwing more food to them. (laughs) Because we want to get them big enough to breed, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty guilty of that. I I have a, you know, involuntary cycle feeding, I guess you could call it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I like that term. (laughs) I I, I might steal that, yeah. Well, in the way I see it, if they're going to eat, they're going to eat. And even when the the two hounds were uh, breeding... Um, mm. the first, after the first couple copulations, I would separate them and, um, <clears throat> they would both still eat. Uh, the only time the female yeah, stopped okay. eating, 
the only time the female stopped eating was uh, after she ovulated. Um, and the male, once they started uh, copulating more frequently, he stopped eating uh, for quite a while. Uh, clear, probably. Huh. Yeah, he didn't start eating again until I think after the eggs were laid. Um, hmm. So. Awesome. That's okay. That's cool. I mean, typical male. Well, they're not Moravian, well, he's not, anymore, but he's not paying attention to anything else. Or <laughs> he didn't. You can worry about food later. And he's got one thing on his mind, kind of a deal. Yeah. So, which is good. You want that in a male. I always get weirded out when my boys eat. When like my carpet males eat, I'm like, no. But then they'll breed anyway. So some will, some won't. <laughs> Like I said at the beginning of the show, there was some talk way back in the day about temperatures for Halma hares and how, you know, this there was this idea where it came from. I don't know that you had to keep them warmer than, you know, typical pythons. What was your approach when temperatures and stuff like that? Um, so initially when I first started back in uh, 2015, 2016-ish, um, mm -hmm. like I said, they were in our living room in our basement. And out there, it gets, it can get down to 65 degrees at night in the wintertime in there. Mm. And so everybody has uh, ceramic heat emitters on thermostat controls. So I would let it get, well, I pretty much let it get as cold as it would get. And then during the day, you know, those temperatures would go up. And then was I talking to, uh, I can't remember if it was, David Means or Chuck Poland mm -hmm. or even Blake, maybe a um, uh, heck it might've even been uh, Keith McPeak. Anyway, someone <laughs> suggested that maybe those <laughs> temperatures at night were still too cold. Uh, okay. And you know, I'd, at that point I had had the snakes for five years. So mm -hmm. I decided, well, it's time to move to the snake room. So I moved everybody into the snake room and my snake room is also in the basement um, and the great thing about it is I don't do any supplementary or I don't do any ambient heating of the room at all. I just okay. let it, you know, in the wintertime at night, it gets cold. And in the summertime at night, it doesn't get cold. So, okay. Okay. Um, so they've been in this room since 2019. Um, and like I said, 2018 was the first time I tried to get them to breed and the one female died. So I was a little gun shy of it and I didn't do anything else, but I brought them into this mm -hmm. room in 2019 and that's where they were for a little more than a year. Um, but my room, uh, what is it now? Like right now it's 81 degrees. Um, and I don't know what time it is, but the supplementary heating or heating in the enclosures is about to turn off. And okay. so mm -hmm. at night in the summertime, it's probably only going to get 79 degrees in here, but in the wintertime, it's going to get down 70, 72. Um, and then with the hounds, sorry, I'm probably not answering your question very well. No, 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 you're, no, good. no, you're, no you're fine. <laughs> so with the hounds, what I did was, um, when I knew in the wintertime, it's going to get cold. I just let their temperatures drop down to like, 73, 74 based off of my thermostat and uh, where the probe is in the enclosure. So you can actually, okay. this is the male's enclosure. You can see the probe kind of dangling there under the cage thing. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And that runs the whole stack of these three cages. So, so anyway, I didn't want the temperature to drop too low. And I think 72 is probably the lowest it got. And then mm -hmm. during the day, nothing in here gets over 84 degrees from supplementary heat. So okay. Okay. every thermostat, except for the babies that have belly heat, those are a little warmer because it has to get through a tub and substrate. Um, so basically, the thermostat is set at 84, 85 degrees um, for the basking area, I guess you could say. Um, okay. Uh, and uh, what do you use for heat? in the adult cages the ceramic heat emitters okay yeah so um so my room also 
I can't remember. Someone was talking a lot about humidity and ambient humidity on mm-hmm. some podcast. I'm sure probably this one um, might be. <laughs> so we were talking about, or they were talking about ambient humidity, and I think this might be one of those, you know, top five things to get difficult species to breed. You know, where mm-hmm. the stars all have to align. Um, mm-hmm. So what I did, well. Okay, I got two stories on this. In November, I added a – so my humidity in this room was about 30%. It was very dry, mm-hmm. maybe 40, mm-hmm. anywhere between 30 and 40%. So I thought, okay, let's bump up the humidity. So I added – I got an uh, Inkbird uh, Hydrostat and uh, just a little mm-hmm. humidifier. And I turned that on and I set it to 55% humidity. You know, in a couple hours, I came in the room and I could tell it's more humid. I did that on, oh crap, I can't remember. I have the date written down. Hmm. I wrote all this stuff down and mm-hmm. left it at work. Uh, <laughs> um, that always the way. I want to say yeah. it was November 11th mm-hmm. that I okay. put the um, humidifier in here. And that following Saturday was the first lock. Now wow. I'm not it's saying, and they had had hacks. They had access to each other since the first of November, but that was the first lock that I saw. Was after I added the humidity to the room. I'm not saying wow. that's what did it. I'm just noticing that that's something happened. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, we, because we use that and then cause and effect. Well, yeah. because at that same time, I also saw my. Solomon Island tree bow is breeding. Okay. So right now the humidifier is off in preparation to lower the humidity as we start getting cooler outside. And then I'm going to hit the humidity again in probably November again uh, to see if that kind of humid cycle is something Interesting. So when you're running that humid cycle, are you running it 24 seven just for that time? Pe- like meaning that you started in November and you're just running it 24 yep. seven or are you doing like a difference from data of 24 seven? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, the, the hydrostat, I said it at, well, right now it's at 55. Um, mm-hmm. and it just maintains that humidity. So I ha- also have uh go V, um, Humid or uh, thermostats in here that are linked to my phone, so I can track everything and temperatures and humidities. And some of the cages have them, but the room has several. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, so technology, right? I <laughs> love it. <laughs> Who freaking knew? I wish we had this. Stuff. I wish we had this stuff in the nineties. Yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but uh, so so yeah, it. I keep it at fifty five. Actually, I had it at sixty. Um, all summer. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty humid in here. Um, I didn't do anything or change that humidity at night. I just, like I said, I let my heat turn off at night throughout the year Mm -hmm. 365. And, um, yeah. And so now when was it, uh, the beginning of this month, I turned it down to 55 and then I think, you know, in a couple weeks I'll probably turn it down to 50 and I'll start seeing how cool we can get it because we're starting to have 50 degree nights here in Kansas Mm -hmm. and that's going to start dropping the humidity down in the house too. You know, once we start running the furnace, whatever this room, I don't use the central high air in the house to heat this Mm -hmm. room. It, I just leave it as it is. So, yeah. So that was, that's the great thing about basements. Oh yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, that was the one thing that I noticed that I added to this room that a lot of the animals changed their behavior um, was when I added the humidity. They they hmm. seem to I mean, respond to it or react to it. I mean, it would make sense, right? We were just talking about this on the, the private stream that we do, and I think humidity came up. And, you know, it's funny because I sort of made – the comment that I would think that that would play more of a part. I think we were talking about Darwin carpets or something. Yeah, we were. Yeah, <clears throat> we were humidity, talking about yeah. um, as far as this, like uh, you know, in their environment, 
and poplin carpets would be the same thing. And they're, they're not really responding to, um, you know, temperature. necessarily temperature drops as much as they're seeing more of a fluctuation between a lot of rain and no rain, <laughs> you know, Dry so like a lot and- of those Indonesian pythons and stuff you would, and even boas for that mm-hmm. matter, you would think that they would respond more to that type of cycle, humidity and rain and pressure fronts and all that kind of stuff, pressure drops and, Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Well, I looked at um, the Spark Weather app. Uh, yeah, the, it's great, right? <laughs> Crawdad Doctor. What's what's yeah. his name? Zach Loaf. Yeah. 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 Uh, he was talking about that, and I went on there, and I looked at Halmahera because every time I get on the computer to look at snakes, I'm looking up something for Halmahera. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, right. and so on there, they have graphs that show – you know, temperature, uh, rainfall, humidity, UV index, yeah. uh, cloudiness. I mean, you name it, it's got it yeah. on there. And I noticed, mm-hmm. like I said, I'm not saying this is what it is, but this is kind of what I'm toying with. Within the months of September to December in um, – now, Halmahera gets a, an ass ton of rainfall. But in those months, yeah. Yeah. the humidity levels, for some reason, drop down. Now it's only like a 10%, 15% at the most drop in humidity. But for some reason in those mm. months that it drops. So hmm. I don't know. Is that something? I mean, if it gets me to breed Halmahera pythons every year, then that's what I'm going to go with. <laughs> <laughs> right, man. Then but yes. that's just something <laughs> I noted. Shot. Everything else for Halmahera Island, as far as temperature, um, and, I, and granted – it's, you know, probably the temperature at a, a weather station or in a city, obviously, mm-hmm. that's there. But the thing is, the temperature's steady. Whether it's five degrees mm-hmm. hotter in the city than it is in the forest, it's still steady temperature. Right. So, right. Um, you know, we went to Mexico this summer, and that's the first time I've ever been to a tropical country. Except, except mm-hmm. for Florida, um, it's its own. Yeah, country, it's, yeah. It's, it's a tropical. It's our <laughs> our tropical country. Um, yeah, right. and I was uh, watching the spiny tail iguanas, and I almost I just sat there thinking to myself, I should write up a, you know, an article or something. Although no one would read it because I can't write for shit, but hmm. I noticed. <laughs> I was paying attention to the weather and the temperature and humidity and when it rained, what it felt like and when it didn't rain and what it felt like in the morning, kind of like, I think Eric, you talked about when you were in Australia, you know, although I wasn't in Halmahera, I started thinking about, um, you know, it's 85 degrees in Mexico, but the humidity Mm -hmm. is 95% and it is hot. You, you sweat, sweat yourself to death. But you yeah. go, and I went down to one of the um, the female uh, spiny tail iguanas would dig these burrows underneath the concrete walkways, or underneath where there was a fountain or something or some type of uh, vegetation. And you go down there, mm-hmm. and I could put my hand in there or put your hand around there, and you could literally feel the temperature was ten degrees different than what it was outside, and even a little, you know cooler to the fact that you could see it. And it kind of got me to thinking about, okay, I'm a snake crawling around the Island. Um, yeah, it might be 90 degrees at the top of these trees, but at the bottom, it's not going to be that way when it rains, it's not going to be that way. So right now I'm still keeping them in a room in a box in Kansas, but I'm thinking (laughs) about how these, how they use that change or how they use those temperatures that makes sense. Right. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It, 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 yeah, opened my, it, it opened that. my eyes to what it could be like. You know, even even we went to Arizona and we went and walked uh, Madeira Canyon, and we went in different elevations. Um, you know, it was hotter than Hades at the bottom, but we had, mm-hmm. you know, we had our coats on as we went up about twelve hundred feet. 
because the temperature dropped right. to about 45 degrees. And when we're standing there, some lady comes over and goes, Hey, there's a little rattlesnake over there. And I'm like, it's too freaking cold for a rattlesnake. But that rattlesnake was laying on a rock right, right there. there. Yeah. And it was uh, cold enough. I wanted to wear a jacket, but it was in the sun and felt perfectly fine. You know, and I, I found snakes yeah. when there's snow on the ground laying out in the sun. So, you know, here wow. in Kansas, but we seem to have that mental block where like it's way too cold for a snake where it's like well it depends on how warm the snake is at the moment he might be like holy crap i need to get into some shade or i'm gonna yeah. die like it's yeah you know it, it's it's interesting it gets me thinking right the idea that um i think that we think that the temperature or humidity or you know weather sort seems to be the trigger for these animals but mm -hmm. if you think about it it's really what's happening because of the weather right so like for instance they may breed a specific time mm -hmm. and <clears throat> we're correlating it to the weather which yeah that's the, the this would be the way but maybe it's it. because their prey starts to reproduce yeah. when that happens you yeah. know what i mean so something in that environment changes and then that that you know, the whole cycle of the, you know, the cosmic octopus as we, as Rob yeah. puts it, um, <laughs> is sort of, uh, you know, going and it, it sort of, you know, will say, okay, well, the weather is this way. There's going to be pr plenty of prey items for, you know, for me to produce some offspring. So let's get to it, you know. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think we, I, well, at least for me, I used to just think in my mind, it would just be, oh, it's the temperature and that somehow that triggers them. But why? Is the temperature trigger or is probably the question we should be asking. And to your point, like when you start to look at the way I did that for the rough scales when we did that rough scale show, and when you're starting to look at the temperatures and how, you know, like you're saying, cloud cover and UV index and all these things, and you start to say, Oh, okay. You just you see it, you know, all the data is right there in front of you. And you're like, Oh, okay, I get it. Now, how do you put it all together? You know, yeah. and then re re reproduce it in your snake room yeah you know, tie it right? together with your feeding and everything else yeah 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 100 percent. i feel like okay. I'm off that's cool tangent. so was there a question no nah, man <laughs> they're always no, no, no tangents no, are no, good that, that, that's that's half of the show is a tangent it's yes, fine yeah 100 <laughs> percent. yeah okay so like so I guess the last thing I would ask as far as your setups and stuff, like, you know, are you, what's your approach to, you got the, the heat, you, you know, you're doing the humidity thing. Are you doing anything special as far as, are you giving them hides, branching, perching, shelving, perching anything hides. like that? Um, <laughs> is it important with these guys? I guess I should ask. Well, know? the important thing is not to give them anything they can wrap their tail on because, <clears throat> Even <laughs> Scrub even the baby, thumbs. damn it! <laughs> well, God, God it doesn't it. <laughs> matter what it is. A Halmahera python can grab onto something yeah. that's a sixteenth of an inch lip on a tub and bring it with them when you're trying to get him out of the cage. So you can but say how many times has it brought the water bowl with it and just yeah knocked it over? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> this is the male's cage right here behind me, and this mm -hmm. is the female's cage. She has a. a uh, a ledge shelf. Yeah. She has a shelf. Yeah. A hide box. What you can't see is uh, this uh, just pointed. You can't even see it. Uh, it's fine. In the male's cage, you can, can kind of see the uh, drain tile that I put in there or the tubing. Um, yeah. The yeah. female loves that. The male, he usually hides back here in the corner. Um, so I really don't do much. Oh, and then I have a larger tub there. You know, just to kind of see what they do with it. Um, they mm -hmm. don't do anything with it. Sometimes the male. <laughs> <laughs> they they don't yeah. care. Sometimes okay. the male yeah. sits on it. And actually the female, when she was um, developing follicles, that's where she sat all the time. So it stays there. Um, mm, okay. So do you put the female in the male cage? Well, that's what I was going to get at or too. So this year, which I think is another one of those five factors for success. <laughs> so do you see this? Oh, that's right. See this plastic thing here? Yes. Um, what I can do is I can slide his cage open, and mm -hmm. they can go back and forth between this tube within the cage. How cool that is, is freaking that? awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and actually, the female used to be in this cage, and the male was in mm -hmm. this cage. 
And, um, and what this is, is this is just a, a, a light cover for a four foot fluorescent light tube light is what that is. Oh. And I just screwed. Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask you to explain it. So yeah. for people that yeah, are I listening, I okay. forgot that no one else. No, 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 no. That's cool. Well, you can <laughs> probably kind of see that it's, uh, it's basically yeah. like you would have a piece of guttering. Um, and then I have little pins made so that the door only slides so far so that they can still get up mm-hmm. and down uh, between there. So like I was saying, the female was in the bottom enclosure and the male was in the top. And you can see mm-hmm. the little tub that's up there in both cages that I use for hide boxes. Mm-hmm. That little tub up there yeah, in yep. the top with the female was in the bottom cage. And so what I would do... So one of the other things I do to, is I'm hands off with the snakes as much as I can. If they need mm-hmm. cleaned and they're not in the tub, then, you know, they don't get cleaned. If they're outside the tub and the tub's dirty, it's skipped. So I just rotate yep. them out. So that tub, and this mm-hmm. was another interesting thing, that tub, the, was in this cage and the female would sit on it. Well, one day they were completely away from the tub. So I took them both out, cleaned them completely and moved this tub up to this cage and the female moved to that cage Mm -hmm. and went into the tub. And then when I, even though you cleaned it, she still realized it was, and then I cleaned it again and I moved it to this cage and she Mm -hmm. moved down there. And then I thought, okay, let's see how many times she'll do this. Every time I clean that tub and I'd (laughs) move it between, I could move it to this end of the cage or that end of the cage, anywhere I moved it, that's the tub she went back to every time. And I'm like, that's her tub. That's nuts. <laughs> that's huh. so nuts. Wow. So are you filling that with any kind of like uh substrate, any moss, any, are you doing, is it, is it humid in there? Are you using that for humidity or is it just the humidity uh, just, in the room for extra humidity? No, just the say. humidity in the room. Um, right. Okay. So yeah, right now there's just uh dry sphagnum moss in there that they can lay on. Okay. Um, Sometimes right. if okay. I don't have moss, I'll just clean it out and put it back in there. Uh, I really only mm-hmm. spot clean. I don't do a full uh, cleaning of all the bedding. And if unless now the male I did because he was kind of having some his cage after breeding and stuff was kind of getting a little funky, so I took some of this stuff out. But um, I used the cocoa mm-hmm. fiber husk um, in their okay. enclosures. Okay. Um, but as far as like, I don't mist or anything, you know, sometimes if I feel like, Hey, I want to see what they'll do. when I do this, I'll drag the hose in from the utility sink into the room and just spray the enclosure down mm-hmm. with the mister and see what happens. And typically nothing. They, they don't <laughs> seem to <laughs> just get yeah. wet. Gotcha. <laughs> and actually the only animals that really seem to uh, respond or react or enjoy, um, the misting is the uh, mm-hmm. Austra- uh, the uh, Solomon Island tree boas. They'll actually just kind of they kind of sit there okay. and they'll raise their head and they'll start to drink and they seem to like it. Uh, so sometimes I'll, I'll mess around. Cool. But the hounds, uh, I don't really miss them. It's just whatever the ambient room temperature is. And then they have a large, like twelve okay. inch bowl of water there. It's so weird because I, I I guarantee you at one point in my early herping career i heard somewhere that scrubs need to be kept and misted like daily or something like that and then we're talking all scrubs because they dry out so quickly and this that and the other well, I had, so to, to yeah so i had weird. barnex in the 90s and um mm-hmm. i didn't miss them they they were on newspaper and four foot plywood enclosures with yeah i never with, missed a, scrubs. with a light bulb yeah. for a heat source <laughs> and they, they had no problems. Now I changed the water and I offered them, you know, a large thing of water. So they like had a Tupperware dish full of water, mm-hmm. but other than that, yeah, never really did it. It's just so weird. So I find it interesting. A couple things. Like, I think like, uh, the fact that your hands off mm-hmm. a lot, I think, I think when you're working with the, I don't know what your opinion is, but and maybe that's why you are hands off, but like, I think that sometimes a lot of people that get these sort of harder to breed species, if you will, 
have a problem settling in and the more that you're handling them and stressing them and, you know, can lead to, uh, not having success. I don't know. What's your thoughts on that? Oh, I totally, totally agree. I think, I think the fact that I had the animals, the adults for the length of time that I did is, it was Mm -hmm. probably led to the success. Um, you know, the animals that Blake had or that the Oklahoma city zoo and Blake bred, um, they were in the mm-hmm. Bronx Zoo for a couple of years before they went down to Oklahoma City. So they were in captivity for quite a while. Um, mm-hmm. So, so I think, I I think the time, yeah. you know, the time thing is, well, I first met Blake in 2015. Um, and mm-hmm. I think at that point, so he had gotten some infertile eggs. I don't know that he had gotten any by then or not. I can't remember to tell you the truth. Um, but I knew they were there prior to that because I had heard him talk about them on the show and we were going through Oklahoma city mm-hmm. one day and I was like, Oh, we're going to the zoo. And I just, <laughs> I just found some, I, I think I messaged him on Facebook and I said, Hey, I'm here. Are you working? And it, I'd never met him before. And he came out and talked to me for a little bit. Um, that's yeah. awesome. Oh, that's cool. So we've been, yeah. like we've been talking for off and on. Well, we talk a lot, actually text a lot, share projects yeah. and stuff. So, <laughs> um, is, is he, is he still doing scrubs? Yeah. Is he still, yeah, he's still got some. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, nice. Yeah. He's still got some stuff and, uh, uh, he, you know, we just, we kind of share what we've been doing and, he really talked me through a lot. Not that he talked me through a lot of it. I just would share with him. I said, Hey, this is what the female's doing. And he's like, yep, that looks good. And he's kind of had to talk me off the ledge now with the babies. Cause they're not eating like I would like, well, they're not eating at all yet. And, um, right. it hasn't, it hasn't been a month since they hatched. And he's like, well, he said his took a month or more to eat. So he's, he's just been kind of a, okay. a shoulder to lean on for me. <laughs> right. And sure. Hmm. Yeah. There's not many people in the world that can uh, say that they've produced how my hair scrubs, yeah. you know I mean? Oh, so it, it, how, how does that feel being in that? It's club? lonely at the top. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think the hands off and then just getting accustomed to, I think Ryan was talking about breeding white lips and it took him several years for the female to become accustomed to what's happening in the room. And then like, even with the sagus, I'll watch them. Um, because I think I've seen Sabu pythons lay clutches throughout many times of the year, you know, maybe not every month, but I've Mm -hmm. seen people get them in the winter and in the spring and in the summer. And I think, you know, I think there's something to, you know, maybe when the parents bred that makes the females breed or how long it takes for them to, um, I guess, acclimate or, Hmm. you know, get to, but Sure. I don't know, maybe that's. Just, but yeah, I think hands off and I, time, and I think all that is probably key to this. Yeah, right. I'm definitely doing a more hands off approach. I, I, uh, I had my first attempt at a tunnel, and uh, from my Timor pythons, and it failed miserably. So <laughs> this weekend we're doing the new and improved tunnel, tunnel. 2.0. Okay. So yeah. You need that uh, lighting cover. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So your tunnel was like a like that. a shift, so they can shift between enclosures. It's, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I I drilled the giant hole between the two cages because they're they're side by side their cages. So I drilled a hole through the, their two walls that are connecting, and then I'm feeding a big PVC pipe through, and then I have end caps that have uh, things you can twist off. So this way I can seal them out from each other, and then seal them yeah. in so when i first uh sorry when i first added this no no you could um what i did mm-hmm. is because the male was starting to pace what i did is i opened the door and let him get in the two tu- in the mm-hmm. shift tube mm-hmm. but didn't let him into the female's cage and after the third day of him squishing himself up in there i thought okay he wants in there pretty well <laughs> uh, it's yeah. good enough <laughs> I, <laughs> he's got to go in now i figured that was gonna yeah. be the same and thing. i could is wait yeah. for them to. Yeah, I could going. tell. Um, and like with the ruffies, when I put the ruffies together, uh, my female will let me know if she is not 
ready to be with a male and the female helm kind of did the same thing where uh, he would crawl over the top of her and she would bump him off. Um, mm-hmm. He, huh. he kind of okay. went through that for about a week and a half before they ever, before she, before they ever ended up, you know, being able to stay in the same area together without her being pissed off at him. But that's why I kind of let him go through between the two cages or the two enclosures because that way she mm-hmm. could get away or he could get away. You know, they could be in totally separate enclosures and, and that happened too. Sometimes they would breed and then they would separate and I'm like, okay. And then I'd feed them. And then a couple of days later I'd open mm-hmm. the door again, nothing. And then a couple of days after that, they'd be locked up. Yeah. And I feel like it's something that would be, cause I mean, even my big adult team was, they don't like being held. That's like, why they you know, pee on you. They're, they're going <laughs> to thank you. Thank you. Like, you know, it's like, I'm not going to sit there and be like, I'm going to hold you until you stop. Like, cause then it will never stop. So if I can find a way to get them together to get me and my little hook out of the equation done, you know, so we'll see. So here's the question as far as, um, another thought, maybe you can put your two cents into it. What is of consistency? Did you try to tweak things? You know, because, in, you know, when you tried the first thing, the first pairing and whatnot, and did you tweak from there or did you stay the course? And, you know, and as far as just your day to day keeping, were you consistent with, you know, what you were doing? <clears throat> so they sort of had a sort yeah. of a cycle. So I would say I was consistent. Yeah. So the first breeding that I got in 2018 okay. between the, the male and another female, mm-hmm. that was in the other room where it got cooler uh-huh. at night but I still maintain the same temperatures. Okay. Um, the only, so I could say the only change was with this pair is that I brought them into the snake room where the ambient temperatures stay a little warmer and it stays right. a little more humid. Other than that, I changed nothing. Right. And yeah. Consistent. Yeah. Okay. Do you do, I know you sort of said you do sort of the, you know, <laughs> The, what what did you call it? The un, what was it? The uh, involuntary. unconditional involuntary yeah. involuntary cycle feeding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So are you the? It's just sort of like come around the you know I guess the beginning of fall you start to feed heavier type of thing and are you backing off at any point other than when they sort of went off feed? Well, right. Um, from either from so from the breeding behavior. Is, um, I'm not going to attempt to breed this female again next year. So my plan is to mm-hmm. kind of just kind of get her back to condition, but maybe um, slow down the feeding a little bit for her. If she'll eat, I'll feed her um, just because, you know, okay. she just laid eggs and I'm not in a hurry to try and get more. Um, but my plan is, mm-hmm. yes, when, you know, next fall comes around or next or yeah, next fall comes around in a year. If I feel like she's ready to breed again, I will probably uh, start upping her feed. And she actually, so what she started doing is she started laying on the cool side. Um, I can't remember when that Mm -hmm. was. I have it written down somewhere. But she started laying on the cool side and she started eating more aggressively um, in the fall pretty much. Um, So that's kind of my plan is to do it that way. Otherwise... I really only feed them about maybe once a month okay. on the hounds. So okay. they don't get very much food throughout the year. And then I'll, I up the feet. My plan is up the females in the fall, which is kind of what I did the last time. Gotcha. Okay. Just because right. they're, they're vigor. They're, the you know, so. They fed, she fed really vigorously uh, last fall when, you know, when it started looking like she was trying to, cool down and stuff so okay awesome <clears throat> so uh okay so you you see how many locks did you see like were they together that whole um whole no time? like i said they would kind of they would lock up for and oddly enough uh <laughs> four of the times they locked up every time i caught them it was a saturday morning so the first thing i do <laughs> Yeah, it was weird. It was like, it's Friday, baby, you know. Uh, 
You yeah. Know, like, <laughs> at least they have some sort of schedule. Yeah. Weekend. Okay. Ooh, so yeah. I get up in the morning, I turn on the coffee pot, and if any of the dogs want to go outside, I let them outside. And then first thing I do is come down to the snake room just to make sure everything's cool. And um, and right. it, oddly enough, like every – and it wasn't every Saturday, but every time I caught him, it seemed like it was a Saturday or a weekend. And I'm, you know, I don't know why. Mm-hmm. Now, that being said, they spent a lot of time together, both of them in that little hide box. Um, so smashed in together, I don't know that they could have bred if they wanted to in there because it's only about a 16, sure. 16 or 18 quart, you know, little tub. Um, and they're both over six foot, seven foot long snakes. Um, but Mm -hmm. as, as time went on, it was sort of, he would go into her enclosure, I'd see a lock and then they would separate as it got closer before she ovulated the male. Um, he was never more than a couple inches away from her until she ovulated. And then once she ovulated, he didn't care anything about her. So he kind of. You know, he always stayed somewhere in the area. If she was inside the hide box, he was on top of it. If she was behind the hide box, he was in the, he was on the um, shelf above her. So he was always somewhere in the area um, towards just before she ovulated. So I don't know if he's protecting her from other males or he's just hoping she'll want to keep going or what. But um, yeah, there wasn't. I mean, that that might be something to think about. um, and I think uh, if you go to the Halmahera Facebook page, I think every lock that I caught, I mm-hmm. posted on there just to, for me, because I try and keep good records, but sometimes I just don't. And I thought, well, I'll just post it. And that way, mm-hmm. if I need to see it, I can go back and look and see when it was. Um, that is the good thing about yeah. posting on Facebook, right? You it's right there. The yeah. date stamp mm-hmm. and the time and all that stuff. And it's all right there. Picture mm-hmm. And look at the date stamp on the picture mm-hmm. it'll have it on there yeah, or i look at yeah i keep finding hatch blake days that I, way i've messaged blake like, and i say hey when was when did i tell you they did this <laughs> <laughs> right on so okay so locking up everything's going good you know what ovulation what was what yeah. was that like is just typical yep. python stuff yeah, it was or, just um yeah. okay i think Well, there was a swelling there for a couple days. It was pretty intense for at least one day. Um, Mm -hmm. And that kind Mm -hmm. of worried me. I thought something was wrong because typically I'll see an ovulation in a snake and it doesn't last that many days. But it was a couple days um, at least. Yeah. Hmm. Um, And then once she did, she would – and this is what I was going to talk about other things about temperatures is – she started wrapping herself around the cage that's where the ceramic heat emitter was. And I thought, okay, she's wanting more heat. So I I turned her heat up to like 87 or 88 degrees Mm -hmm. and she would Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. leave it. No, I would still turn it off at night, but every morning, um, when it came on, she would go up there and lay there all day. And then at night she would go back into the hide box. Um, yeah. And there were several times, I think I've got some pictures. I don't know if I ever posted them, but there were several times she was, you know, wrapped around that thing, uh, just trying to absorb as much heat as she could. If I could figure out a way to get belly heat in there, I probably (laughs) could do that. But yeah, it's funny. Lucas was doing maternal incubation with his, uh, brettles and, the female would leave the eggs and go around that cage thing with the heat emitter that yep. he has and, and, and then kind of wrap around it and stay on there for a little while and then go back to the eggs. It was, uh, yeah. yeah it's, I was speaking of uh, maternal incubation. Mm-hmm. I forgot to mention that when I first bred uh, white lips pythons back in the nineties, I did a maternal Jesus. incubation with them I, <laughs> because I, because I had no idea <laughs> how to incubate snake eggs. And I thought she'll know right. what to wow. do she did it. <laughs> That's <laughs> balls, my friend. Yeah, that is, that is ballsy. <laughs> that is like, oh, you know, it's just, it's just rare kind of python. I'll let her have them. So when I was doing the show notes, I was looking through your pictures on, on your Facebook. And so is that picture of the white lip 
maternally incubating. Is that your okay? Because I, I, I was like, man, did he breed yep. white lips? I didn't know he bred God. white lips. And I was like, this is like way back from the, you know, Can't from shame. the '90s. And I was like, oh, maybe it's this a, is somebody else. I didn't, I didn't even realize. <laughs> yeah, it's furthermore, like a, Shane is able to breed like everything I'm constantly failing at: rough scales, white lips. It's like, yeah, this is just uh, all the greatest hits. So, yeah, jeez. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, so she laid the eggs. Yeah. Well, I mean, then what? What was? It? <laughs> yeah, we got to talk um, about. So yeah. What was the what was feeling like? like man? I mean, I mean, um. Well, I can tell you this right now, and and Owen, yep. I appreciate the accolades for breeding difficult species, but to be honest, it has done nothing but <laughs> brought me sleepless nights. I can. Yeah. Uh, right, I can yeah. Um, <laughs> Take being a, mm. a kid at Christmas, not being able to sleep and yeah. add your worst it's fears good, to it. It's, it's not just a good wake up. It's ridiculous. A, a, all night. Yeah. So I can't remember if I posted any pictures of her, but before she laid, um, it was weird because the eggs started to separate. So, she, you know, mm. she was one long tube of, you know, swollen eggs and I could see as she got further along and became more emaciated, you could see the bumps. I could count them. Um, And I thought, Oh God, she's going to die. Well, a couple days before she laid, one of the eggs moved down to the vent. So it separated from the group. And I thought, this is it. She's egg bound. She's going to die. And again, Blake's like, calm down. It's fine. (laughs) And yeah. So I came downstairs on the day she was laying expecting to find her dead because um, two eggs had moved down to the point where I could, I could see one egg at her vent and another egg a couple inches up and then all the rest of the mass was high. And I came downstairs and she wasn't laying on the shelf under the heat like she normally mm-hmm. was. And I lift open the tub and I just see this one pearly white egg and another one coming out of her cloaca. Wow. And I can't remember. I am almost positive. I ran upstairs and woke my (laughs) wife up and probably pissed her off. (laughs) And my daughter, who's 22, who just moved back in with us from uh, college. uh, We all got up and came downstairs and (laughs) and watched her lay one of the eggs. And I was just like, Oh my God. It was just like I said, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around, around it. And, and like I said, from this, from that point on for this whole time, I've done nothing but lose sleep (laughs) and think of everything that could possibly go wrong. And, uh, it just was surreal or not real. Um, and, and I, and, you, you asked me kind of why I did the hounds. Um, I don't remember who it was. I know uh, Yasser mm-hmm. from Spitfire Reptiles has said this before. Um, and he's a really cool guy. He and I have talked a little bit. Um, he said, someone asked a question about breeding uh, scrub pythons. And he said, give up on hounds. It'll never <laughs> happen. Yeah. And Someone said, someone said before I got my first helm, and this is what kind of led me to it was, um, no one's ever been able to breed them before. And in my head thought, I'm going to give it a shot. And I did it. I think that was seven years ago. Yeah. It, it, Look at you now. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> so, no one, no one ever right. thought it was going to be an easy project or a quick one, but. Oh, I never, I never thought I'd be able to. And. And, you know, there is, there is always that I want to be the first. I was super, super flattered and super stoked when Blake sent me the pictures of the first ones. uh, Cause I knew he was so much further along than I. And, um, and then when I saw Chuck and I saw the, uh, the guy in, uh, um, Reptilia Europe is the guy. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Him and him and Chuck actually, their first clutch is laid on the same days. Or at least they posted yeah. that they did anyway. Um, but I was I was so flattered that Blake shared that with me, even though I was still a little jealous that he did it. Before <laughs> me. Right. Um, but now right. I don't it, doesn't, care. it doesn't matter. 
Like, oh my, you're in there within like a handful of people. Like this, yeah, come on. That's yeah. awesome, man. Well, and I I can't say, you know, obviously someone did it in Indonesia because quite a few babies came count. in <laughs> in 2019 mm-hmm. or 20. So someone else did it. Of course, they kind of did it in their own backyard. I'm thinking, yeah, it's like green know. cord snakes for yeah, us, right? Like, you know? come on, like, yeah, <laughs> they set up a cage outside right. and locked all the helms in there, and then the rigs, yeah. like, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm, and I, I know that because in that Daniel Nutouche paper that he wrote about um, mm. green tree pythons, there's a chart in there of egg size and how Mahara python eggs. Right. Are. So we had to okay. get it somewhere. Yeah. So I was going to ask yeah. that, like, when you sent me the picture. You know, you sent me a, um, a message saying like that you got the eggs and they kind of look different than like long or longer or something. Are they mm. are they shaped differently than normal python eggs or am I just seeing? Well, they were pretty long. They were definitely different than like Brettles pythons or the rough scale right. pythons. So I compare them to the Brettles pythons because they're the mm. same size of snake, I guess okay. you could say. So the Brettles pythons, when I had them, they were ping pong ball shaped, a little bit bigger, maybe golf right. ball size. Um, but the helm eggs were very long. It was like if you took a chicken egg, a large chicken egg, and stretched it yeah. a little bit. Weird. Now, I don't know that that's going to be the case every time. I can't remember. I don't remember what Chuck's look like or I don't remember what Blake's look like. Um, but like even with my Sabu's, my female Sabu that's laid several times, she's had long eggs and she's had round eggs. Um, so I'm not sure what egg, sh- how egg shape is determined, but that's what they look like was big chicken eggs stretched out. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, they look like, like they look like the Madagascar hog um, eggs that I had this year. They're just long. Um, was there a lot yeah. of room for the baby when they hatched? Cause I mean, it almost seems like in these long eggs, the baby takes up the whole freaking egg and it's just, there's no room left in there for any kind of yolk when it's done. Yeah, no, when they hatched, um, there was, they actually spent about two mm. days in the eggs after they first started pipping. Um, so I imagine there was probably a little yolk in there when they hatched. Anything that was attached was no bigger than, um, maybe a little bit bigger than a pea or a kidney bean. Uh, any yolk or mm-hmm. anything. Um, That's so cool. But they all did when they came out. They all had a bit of umbilicus attached to them. Uh, one of them, the umbilicus didn't kind of fall off that quickly, so I took it off myself because I didn't want it to get right. caught on anything. Um, but, yeah, they, they filled up the eggs. Um, when they hatched, they were uh, – shoot, hold on just a second. I want to say when they hatched, they were averaged about 72 grams. Oh, that's pretty Really? That's pretty it big. is. Yeah. That's a big baby. Okay, so I measured mm-hmm. the eggs, um, the eggs that I could measure, and they were, you know, 10 centimeters by four and a half centimeters, nine centimeters by four and a half centimeters. So they are about four and a half centimeters wide but anywhere from 10 to 8 to 11 centimeters long. Wow. Wow. Um, And then when the babies – I'll have that on my hatch record, but, yeah, they were about 70 grams when they hatched. How how long did it – how long was incubation? Um, 81 days. 81. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. And I incubated them at um, 87 and a half okay. degrees. So uh, when I talked to Tracy, I had messaged her and I said, hey, you know, I've I've bred other snakes, but I've never bred scrubs before. Any uh, incubation methods that you want to float my way, mm-hmm. you know, let me know. And uh, She called me and we talked and she said, treat them just like any other python that you've incubated before. All right. So that's okay. what I did. Uh, okay. I know Chuck incubated his at a lower temperature and he went like 90 okay. days. Um, I think Blake's also went 90 days and he incubated at 87 and a half. It's still longer than um, like 
Carpets are what? 60? Yeah, scrubs are typically longer. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. That's cool. It's like retics and olives yeah, like and retics. my my olives hatch at the same time too, but I've had issues, so I might want to try to incubate them cooler next year if I get them. Hmm. So hmm. um what did you um, use as far as did you use a substrate or no substrate for the eggs? Um, I set them up as no substrate. Well, no substrate. So I put a layer mm, of perlite with right. water, a light diffuser grade over that, two light diffuser grades right. actually. And then I use a uh, plastic uh, mm-hmm. shelving material that you line, line your cabinets with so that the eggs don't sit on those open holes of the light mm-hmm. diffuser oh, okay. grate. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I do that. And then. For my incubator, I used to run just a dry incubator, and then I would worry about the humidity inside the egg box itself. And then when I talked, to, or not talked to, but I heard Buddy Bashemi talking about how he did his incubator with a, a pan of water with an aeration yep. stone in it. And I thought, you know, I'll give that a try. So last year when I had um, rough scale and Savu python eggs, I did that. And I found that the amount of condensation inside the egg box reduced a lot when you had humidity outside the egg box in the hmm. incubator. So, so now I run what I guess you'd call a wet incubator and with the air stone, you know, in a, mm-hmm. in a pan of water. Is that constantly on? Is that constantly on? Like constantly running? Yeah. Okay. Right. Constantly running. Yep. Okay. And I would say with this, uh, with the Halmahera clutch, I used an egg box that was quite a bit taller. I think it's 12 inches tall, 8 inches wide, and 13 or 14 inches long. And as far as the um, uh, condensation inside, Mm -hmm. it never developed condensation until about two weeks before they started hatching. And I had ventilation holes. I had two quarter-inch ventilation holes in the lid two quarter inch ventilation holes on the side and one ventilation hole in the bottom below the eggs. Okay. And the reason I did that was because I read a, so when I went to Northern California Mm -hmm. uh, to the conference up there, there was a a talk on egg incubation Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. I had been looking for some information on uh, Calabar burrowing pythons. And I remember that was the first year in 1993 that someone had bred them in California. And anyway, I found this little notes or whatever from this egg symposium that they did, this little mini talk. And someone talked about uh, ventilating the bottom of the egg mm-hmm. box because they thought that maybe um, the babies that were dying full term in the egg were dying because the CO2 mm-hmm. – that they're expelling was increasing and couldn't escape from inside the egg so box. Just building up. Mm, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So I, I drilled a hole in the egg box that was just above the water mm-hmm. level, but lower than the eggs themselves. So that way, if there was, and I can't tell you if it worked or not, but well, you hatched them. It. <laughs> so, it hatched them. Hatched so them. It, yeah. it, it, it worked. <laughs> You got what you yeah. wanted. So so that if you want to say if anything in the process has been changed or tweaked uh, from me incubating eggs, the only thing that's changed is I've I now use a wet incubator and ventilation holes in the egg box mm-hmm. itself. I wonder if because I feel like oh, go ahead. I feel like okay. if you know that females wrapped around those eggs laying under a rotting log, She's not keeping them in complete airtight yeah, no. um, coils all the time. You know, like Zach or um, uh, whoever you said, I'm sorry, uh, had his Brettles python. Oh, oh yeah, Lucas. Yeah, yeah, Lucas. Yeah. Yeah. Lucas, yeah. You know, the eggs getting air is, to me, as important as mm-hmm. the humidity in the air. So I don't see... And, you know, I guess you can skin the cat however you want, but I don't see why you have to have an egg box that's completely airtight is what I'm saying, yeah. I guess. 
And if it's just for humidity, then I just said, okay, then I'll make the incubator humid. I wonder if that would work with uh, or help with like some of those weird ones like blackheads and walnuts where yeah. you can't really get the eggs wet, but they have to be humid still, you know? So it's kind of like this weird bat game they play back and forth with those species. Um, interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Well, the egg, the egg idea, that was, they were talking about, um, uh, shoot some kind of lizard i want to say a chameleon but i think i'm mm -hmm. wrong but it still got me to thinking because i've i've had eggs you know babies die full term in the egg that looked absolutely yeah, fine yeah so have i yeah. Yeah. and you know they've pipped stuck their head out went back in and died and it's like well, yeah. why yeah. so so that babies hatch out i mean how now what <laughs> it's like cool next how's step. that ride been yeah <laughs> i know you said they're not eating yet but you know uh, you know one of the things that rob yeah. did you think that they were well i guess now at this point you would have known that they mm. didn't hatch out red but i can't tell you how excited rob was in australia when i guess it was chuck that hatched them out and they mm -hmm. weren't red mm -hmm. and he was like he was doing car i told you they weren't red <laughs> I was like oh okay man <laughs> Yeah, Blake's Blake's weren't. I mean, obviously Blake, yeah. Blake's weren't yeah. red either when his hatched in 2018. Um, <clears throat> uh, they are so they're. <clears throat> it's kind of weird because some of them are kind of an olive green and black like their uh -huh. mother, and then one of them is almost just completely jet black. It's a little one of the little That's males. Right. Now he's lightened up since he hatched, but when he came out, it was like. Did I hatch oh, a black no. one? Oh no, a <laughs> no, morph. <laughs> it's like <laughs> Yeah. What? No, 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 don't do this to me. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> no, morphs make my brain yeah. melt. That's why I uh, the normal looking yeah. stuff. So so yeah, um th there's a variability between the animals themselves. Um do you see that with your adults? Because I know I've seen some, like, you know, Rob showed me pictures of all the ones that he's worked with and whatnot. And some of them are mm -hmm. like, you know, really reduced patterns and green and, and yeah. you know, like a real light brown, almost not yellow, but like a golden brown, if you will, you oh. know? Um, yeah. Yeah. So my female, she's like an olive green mm -hmm. color. The male is kind of a slate gray and it has large black bands kind yeah. of on him or large black blotches. And then the newest female I have, she's like pewter gray with olive green blotches. Okay. And, um, you know, so, yeah. So that's kind of one thing. That's that, cool though. Yeah. yeah. Did you? Yeah. It's they're they're variable variable. And I've kind of been thinking a lot lately about, so I sent some skins to, um, Warren Booth. Ben oh, Ben Moore. Moore. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I did the, um, he basically sent me a paper back kind of saying, I, I just wanted to know how closely related they were. I sent him some rough scale and some Halmahera mm -hmm. skins cool. because my thought is if these, if all these animals we're getting over here are coming from the same general area, then we're, you know, we're just kind of breeding pretty close gene pool yeah. i guess <laughs> yeah so i wanted so what i'd like to do and i kind of tried to do this before is if we could get a library of this mm -hmm. stuff of skins and shit send to someone and say this is where they are kind of start a stud yeah. book i guess you yep. could say we were just talking about that captive yeah, animal. yeah. yeah of, of captive animals even if they're not breeding you know you can say these two animals are closely related so that maybe you figure out where they come from. I talked to a guy in Europe that I can't remember his name. He showed a picture of one that came from an Island off the coast of Halmahera. Hmm. And I was kind of talking to him and he said, yeah, they, you know, Halmahera is a very large mm -hmm. Island. Um, you know, and I, when I look at it on a map, I don't know how big right. it is. It's that big you know? on the page. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> right. I've, I've been on an island. You can stand on one beach and see the people mm -hmm. on the other beach on the other side. So when you say island, that's what's mm -hmm. in my right. head. Uh, so I'm curious to find out, you know, it'd be cool to see where everything that we have in, in captivity right now mm -hmm. is from. 
and if those animals that look the same are from the same area, um, you know, maybe that's a, a lot deeper hole to go down, but, but that's just kind of what I've been thinking about. It would also about. be good because then maybe if you're thinking about breeding your one snake, you can try to find somebody who's got offspring that are not as related to than this guy's, and that might help with keeping gene pools diverse. Yeah. And it would definitely help with rare species and I feel like, like you've got going on. I feel like this is definitely a good species to mm-hmm. do that with because it's so we're in infancy in captive breeding. Mm-hmm. Do it now. I yeah. feel like we're about to see a boom in uh, captive breeding um, because there have been a lot of animals come mm-hmm. in and hopefully a lot of those animals haven't died. And hopefully a lot of those animals are in the hands of people that know it there, or, you know, that can mm-hmm. get it, that can do it. And now would be a good time to set that groundwork to, you know, kind of make sure we're not just, you know, I don't know, yeah. you know, putting them all yeah, together. Sure. Yeah. Were they unrelated? So, Were they unrelated? Um, yeah, they're fairly nice, unrelated. Nice. Um, That's good. So what about the roughies? <laughs> <laughs> they're the same. <laughs> um, actually, well, you would think, um, I'd have to go back yeah. and read it again, but he, uh, Dr. Morrill was actually so, a little surprised at how far apart they actually were, even though they all came from the same five animals. Hmm. He said, you know, I'll have to, I'd have to yeah. look at what he yeah, wrote. Yeah. 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 No um, worries. Yeah, yeah. Comments, but, but yeah, I was kind of surprised about that too. And cause I talked to Cameron about these snakes and he said, I think he said he produced both of them, but, um, you know how stories go from yeah. <laughs> six, seven oh, yeah, years yeah. ago. But, and, yeah. um, and I mean, there were only five. Yeah. You, yeah. That tree can only split so far, <laughs> right. you know, yeah. over several yeah. continents. Yeah. It can only go so far. Yeah. <laughs> right. so, huh. yeah. yeah. But yeah. okay. But yeah, I'd like to, I'd, I'd be interesting, yeah, interesting thing to do. And I, I did send some skins to, um, um, uh, Dr. Booth also, uh, just to help him build up a library. And once these babies shed, I'll probably send him some more skins if he's interested in them. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's, that's very cool, man. That, that, that must be a cool feeling to be on that, the ground floor of, of a project like that, you know, uh, and, and be able to, if I can do all the things right, that, weren't necessarily done right. Not because they've intentionally done wrong, but just, mm-hmm. you know, either the technology or the knowledge wasn't there at the time. Yeah. Well, I talked to Terry, um, of uh, Terry in Texas. Burwell. Uh, Burwell. Yeah. Yeah. Terry Burwell, uh, quite a while ago. And when I first started getting, or when I had some rough scale pythons, I think it was just before he got his first clutch of rough scale pythons. And we were talking about stud books for these, you know, some of these rare captive animals, I think that would be a really neat thing to do. And coming from the zoo, I know what a stud book is. I know what it's for mm-hmm. I know how we use it. Mm-hmm. And when I worked at the zoo in the 80s and 90s, stud books were on paper and you mailed stuff to each other. You didn't have the technology <laughs> yeah. we have yeah, today. The right. digital SSPs so and... We could main, yeah. Right. Yeah. We could maintain a really good data, you know, set of data for the stuff that would be pretty, you know... Uh, pretty accurate yeah you wouldn't have to wait for somebody to send in their documents or whatever so cool that would be cool. because i i have so much time to do all yeah, that. <laughs> but the same when are you doing all that <laughs> like it god so i guess my last question so on the hands and then maybe the we hand. can talk a little rough scales and then we'll do the closing questions or whatever if you want to mm-hmm. talk sabus rough scales whatever um how do how do you set the babies up like you know just perching water bowl basic type of tub type of situation yeah, yeah. uh there are 16 quart sterilite tubs are sitting right here in front of me actually um well here oh hey visual ah. Ooh. okay so right. it's with the fun perching looks like a coat hanger <laughs> so, yeah so yeah, he has no, some perching yeah, yeah. with uh multiple points to- of you know, contact. Yeah. And is that it sitting? I use the cocoa fiber. Um, so the reason there's a little container in there, mm. he's not liking this very much. <laughs> um, I started with paper towel. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. 
um, in the whole enclosure. And then I gave him a moist hide. And then this weekend, um, Blake said he used sphagnum moss in for his substrate. Uh And, uh, so this weekend I went with a cocoa fiber and, um, I noticed that all the snakes are staying out of the moist hide because their enclosure is moist. Okay. So they must have liked the humidity or a change in humidity. So, um, and some of them are actually, um, I also put the hangers in there this weekend and some of them are actually hanging from the hangers with their heads pointing down. Nice. So I'm hoping that means they're looking for food. Good. And um, not all of them are doing that. And the only thing I've gotten from any of them as far as feeding is one of them grabbed a live hopper mouse and killed it, but didn't eat it. Good okay. solid murder. Um, so, was it? I'm trying to just be patient. <laughs> yeah, man. Are these um 15 quart tubs that you had for these guys? Uh, 16, 16 quart. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I I yeah. Uh, so, That's awesome. Man. So far, we've tried live. Are we? Yeah. I mean, are you planning to just keep going with live, or is it like next step is going to be bird and stuff like that? Um, I've tried. Uh. So my first thought was just live mouse pups mm-hmm. uh, for the movement. Mm-hmm. And I did it like two weeks after they hatched. Nothing. Um, I tried frozen thawed and I had a lot of success with boiled um, Pinks? Uh, boiled chicken broth. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. With the rough scales. Mm-hmm. So one of them took and wrapped a frozen thawed uh, pinky that was in um, the boiled chicken broth, but didn't take it. Damn it. It seems to be they're just like their parents mm. when they come in, they're extremely weary of me. Right. So I feel like it's not going to be taken off the tongs. I think they're going to have to eat it when at night when I'm not in here. Because at night, if I come in here at like 1 o'clock in the morning, they're all cruising they're around their moving. enclosures. Yeah. Yeah. And this, just since I changed their enclosures a little bit and added the different uh, medium, mm-hmm. um, is when I've noticed they're out during the day. So I think they're feeling a little more secure, a little bit more comfortable with a little bit higher humidity. Um, so I think it's just going to be a matter of, you know, maybe a week or two before they're um, grabbing them. Like I said, that one did grab a live hopper mouse and kill it. That's, that's so. a plus. It's a step in the right direction. Yeah. yeah it's just, yeah, they got to get it to go the distance. Yeah. And I, I do have a friend that has some lizards, and he's usually pretty good to send me the skin. At least I can try shed skin now. I do. Uh, I, I have can to. now vouch for knobtail gecko skin. Really? Yep. It's nice. It's stretchy. You can wrap the whole pinky with it. And uh, if the pinky's still <laughs> wet, it'll stick right to it. And apparently, Madagascar hognose crush it. So. That's going in my back pocket for later. <laughs> so that's how I got my Haitian boas to eat uh, wrapping a knoll skin yeah. in uh, on around a pinky. Yeah. Now you see why I have all these lizards. Shut up! No, you don't. <laughs> it's not it. You didn't help me. Crystal and okay. me helped me. So <laughs> throw them, throw them in the freezer, and then send me the. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Take those Kims, kill them. Yeah, but it's and uh, it worked out. Being being a being a reptile lover, it is not easy to use a lizard as a feeder no. because yeah i i got some anoles from a friend in florida he sent them up to me and i was like oh that's the most beautiful anole i've ever seen <laughs> yep. and then i'm thinking what are you thinking it's feeding to something <laughs> yeah don't keep it <laughs> yeah i uh i i reached out to a couple friends who gave me dead lizards to thaw out with the pinkies and i got uh, i got one mad hog eating off of that but as I'm falling these out, I'm like, ah, that was a nice looking crested. Like that was that's a cool looking guy. Like that's that's upsetting. Yeah. Like so, yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things. Okay. Um, so is that so this I guess this would be a rob we're almost at two hours. See, yeah. I told you it would be uh yeah, we'd have fly, plenty to talk flies. about. <laughs> when you're having fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I ramble. It's still- that's that's perfect for podcast. Got eleven <laughs> years of rambling. That's how we've done the show. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so do you? So with roughies, right? They're notoriously tough to get going. So that's what you're doing with them too. Is all these tricks that you're doing with the hounds? Is, are you using those tricks that you use with the roughies to get going with these? 
Yep. Okay. Yeah. So the last clutch that I had last year, um, I've still got all of them here. Um, dum, dum, dum. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I need more rough scales. Well, so Owen's get... just on this kick where he's getting I'm rid of everything kick, and just having everything and getting my rough scales like collection to be the big rough scale collection that I want. So I keep learning that all these well, rough scale people that I know are like, yeah, I got like six or seven of them. Shit. Like you guys all, all got babies from last year. And I'm like, God, my wallet can't take this. <laughs> like it is. <laughs> if you look at my Facebook page, there was one in there that looked a little different. Yeah. I was going to ask about that. And one. Um, I talked to Nick about it. Cause I felt like it was an inbreeding depression. Mm-hmm. Uh, situation Mm -hmm. and he didn't seem to think so so i'm keeping all the babies um just to see if it's something just to see yeah fun um if if nothing else i think it's a poly it's a polymorphic trait Mm -hmm. yeah polygenic trait um because i i just can't see something like that coming out i would i I, yeah sporadically i guess i wouldn't be shocked because i mean i know the ones that um, the male that I, I, I unfortunately lost my female after she laid eggs, uh, was that last year? So I, and they were the ones I got from Dave D that kind of had these stripes going on all on their sides. And I would say that mm-hmm. maybe that was something that could have been refined or tweaked or some of that. They have variations just looking at them pattern wise and how much each one brown, cream colored and stuff like that. So there could be room. Yeah, for there was a lady when I first got mine, mm-hmm. there was a lady in Australia that reached out to me. And she had several pattern. I'm, I hate to use the word mutation. Mm-hmm. She had several pattern anomalies in animals that she had mm-hmm. that she said she wanted to try and um, breed for. You know, so you know maybe there is something. Yeah. And I I still feel like it was incubation fluke or inbreeding depression. Mm-hmm. Now that being said, this is my fourth clutch of rough scale python eggs, mm-hmm. and it has not been a easy road. The first one was five eggs; only one baby made it to uh, the full term, mm. and when it was born, its head was completely mangled. Great! It was not no eyes. Yeah, Man. it was terrible. The next clutch that I had, I had ten eggs. Um, incubation went great. I came home from same celebrating pairing. my daughter's birthday. Same yeah, same pairing. Okay. I uh, came came home from celebrating my daughter's birthday, and I could smell something. No. I opened the incubator door, and every single one had died in the egg. That uh, was that I was my first clutch. All five DOAs fully yeah, formed. Couldn't tell Just, if know. they. I couldn't tell if they even tried to pip mm. or not. And there was a set of twins, so there was eleven out of ten eggs twins um Jeez. which i could tell if even if the twins hatched i don't think they'd have made it they were maybe like five grams they were extremely small jesus um and then so my next clutch i had in 2018 which was funny because it was also at the same time i had a clutch of savu pythons mm. um everybody wanted to talk to me about savu pythons but nobody wanted to talk to me about <laughs> rough scale pythons and i was excited about the rough scale pythons Right. I would have talked to you. Yeah. Like, you just call me. If you ever want to talk roughies or get geek, just shoot me a message, man. <laughs> so that that third clutch, I ended up out of nine eggs, four made it to the point that they were eating and – or no, I'm sorry. Two made it to the point that they were eating well enough that I sold them. And the only reason I sold them was because I got – I was diagnosed with cancer. Right. And – Two of the other ones I was still hand feeding and I gave those to a friend of mine because I didn't know, you know, what my treatments were going to be like and what I would have to do. I took them to him. He took them home, set them up. They both ate that day. I hate that. I've had that happen. Yeah. Where, yeah I had, um, I was during my so, move and stuff like that. Somebody took one, one of my rough scales that was not eating and sent me a video of it just coming across the room, nailing a rat and dragging it back in. And I was, furious like are you yeah. kidding me yeah so this last clutch that i had um i incubated the eggs a little bit higher temperature at 88 and a half degrees because several other uh, casey and um 
um, Nick and mm-hmm. a few other people had mentioned, like Casey, he incubates his rough scales at 89. Yeah, I heard that. Is what he told me. That's insane. So I did mine higher, and these all of these animals came out. Um, they all pipped before I could get a chance to help them pip. Um, several of them were biting me straight off the bat <laughs> and doing the little threat display. Oh, oh nice. Mouth open. Oh, yeah, as a baby. I'm like, oh, yeah, you're tough. Oh, that's cool. That is, oh. <laughs> That's it. I want that. Everything um, leaves. <laughs> and so the one special looking one, the reduced pattern one, ate the first time I ever even tried and has not had a problem since, other than it has a problem shedding. Nah, is that nah. number three? Or is it the one that you have on your, like, if you go to your Facebook page, is it number three that's the odd one? Or is it the one that, the one that says it had a little rough start? Um, no, the little rough start one is still rough starting. He okay. eats on his own, but he also, so there are three animals out of the six that mm. have problems shedding. And I don't understand why, because the other three, don't. um, don't, don't, but they're huh. all eating on their own. Um, okay. so that going back to your original question and is yes, this time I feel like the babies were a lot more, um, uh, more robust yeah, and the boiled chicken broth seemed to do the trick for everybody. It was like, suddenly, you know, that's what I want. And, and it, and it worked. Um, mm. So you're just taking bo- chicken broth, boiling it, putting the prey item in it and then feeding it and boom. That yeah, goes so to- I, I boil a little bit and then I throw an ice cube in it just to let it cool. Mm-hmm. And my guess is it, it maybe makes it a little bit more uh, pungent or a little stronger in the smell. Mm-hmm. And then I'll take the frozen thawed pinkies and that are already thawed mm-hmm. and I'll just kind of soak them in there for a little bit. Um, okay. okay. And now all of them, when I open the tub, all of them come to the front to eat. So <laughs> that's freaking yeah. great. And then I'm going to try this pair again next year. The female, she's actually staring at me right now. Nice. Um, <laughs> uh, I've got her. She's, She's in better body condition now than she's ever been going mm-hmm. into a season before. Uh-huh. So um, I have to curb my um, – when I see her looking at me like this, uh-huh. I have to curb I have to curb myself from going, oh, you need something to eat. Oh, he's on the food. Here you go. Yeah. It's, right. Yeah. Um, I've got her on a diet but a slow diet to get mm-hmm. her to a good weight because – yeah, once she starts breeding, um, she stops eating. The male will stop eating in uh, January, and then I'll start putting them together about mid-January. Um, as long as she doesn't start flinging poop everywhere and pushing him around, um, then I know she's receptive to him. Nice. Um, and then they both kind of stop eating, and then she won't eat again until after she's laid the eggs and I take them from her and stuff. That's awesome. That's awesome. One and I day. do uh, one day. <laughs> I guess I I guess I do their so their their heat goes off also at night. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's just the natural temperature of the room that gets lower. And then when she um uh when she's got eggs in her belly, she does the same thing as the uh hounds. She, you know, heats herself up constantly. So I bump up her heat a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So awesome. it's, I, I really hoped it would have been, uh, an easier road or a better road. You know, you always kind of get those projects and think this is going to be great. I'm going to start selling rough scale pythons every year and have mm-hmm. a whole room full of all these nice cages and stuff. And now it's just, mm-hmm. I want to figure out why we're having this little problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know other people, you know, maybe they have problems, uh, or maybe they it. don't. Yeah. I've heard some people say, yeah, they have one or two that aren't great. Uh, mm-hmm. I know Nick said he had a whole clutch that he tried to maternal incubate, uh, kind of went tits up on him, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. We just want to uh, see if there's uh I just uh, want more. <laughs> what, uh, what, what do you call it? Oh, and like the bumps are on the eggs. <laughs> I just want to see, I want her to hold onto the eggs long enough so that her scales um, leave a, 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 a impression on the eggshell. Then I can take them, which, um, mine did. Because she had them for the whole day because she laid them in the morning and I didn't get to her till the <laughs> evening. And there was some markings on the eggs from her scales. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. I have a picture of that from my last from this last yeah. clutch. Yeah. I, I just, my wife yeah. thought it was stupid. She's like, so what? It's what? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what? Do you understand? It's insanely you don't understand. <laughs> what do you you don't you don't get it? <laughs> like uh, it's uh, um <laughs> Our poor uh, wives. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, this is what's ramble about reptiles. No. Nope. Yeah. Uh, well, she's a good sport because she's asked me for years to stop breeding rodents in the garage because they stink. And I can't bring myself to feed my snakes rodents other than the ones that I've bred. <laughs> um, I'm going to try cold blooded cafe and see, you know, how they like them. But I feel like I know what those, you know, I have, I have, a rat colony that's 12 years old without ever adding another rat to it. Yeah. Oh, wow. And, okay. And you know what they're all eating and you know what you're putting into your snake. So yeah, if I had the space and I could set them up somewhere far away from my house or a little bit further away, I'd probably do it. I've done it before. So yeah. Yeah. It is. Cold, it is. Cold blood cafe is good. I use them. Yeah. They're, yeah. They're, they're pretty good. Yeah. I've, I've talked to them a little bit and, you know, like I said, I've I've gotten uh, rodents from other places before, and they weren't terrible. But I've also heard people have horror stories about them. Mm-hmm. I haven't heard any horror stories from Cold Blooded Cafe, so I'm going to give them a shot. And if it works out, then I you know I may stop breeding rats at least and just breed mice so that I have babies to feed babies. Yeah, yeah, so. it's all right. I my wife wants to breed button quail now because I brought baby button quail home and they were adorable. <laughs> they didn't last much. They didn't last very long. So she well, can I have do a friend, it, but I have yeah. a, a friend that has an aviary and she breeds all kinds of different birds. And mm-hmm. I said, you know, if you breed any quail or anything dies, you know, can I have it? And she was like, well, what would you want with it? And I said, for snake food. And she won't even give me the dead ones. Aww. <laughs> oh, wow. So, it's not fair. I mean, she you didn't know. understand, what, you know, what I was asking. She was like, "No, I'm not going to keep them. In the, I'll keep them in the freezer." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. so, why? What do you want it for? Oh no! <laughs> right. I'd rather throw them in the trash. Okay. Yep. Yep. All right. Yeah. Uh, all right. All right, man. So, this has been awesome. Final uh, questions. So we'll just. But go Owen's going to hit you with the final questions, and yep. uh, and then yeah. we'll uh, we'll bug out. I've, so I've waited like ten years for this. <laughs> <laughs> well, now uh, it's your turn, I, man. Yeah, and I have no idea what to say. Yeah, I know. It's the everybody's, everybody's <laughs> every time you listen, you're fun. saying what you would say. Like, no, why is he saying that? I would yeah. say this, and, and then now when it's you your get turn, here, man. you don't know. All right. So if you could keep any <laughs> reptile at all without having to worry about anything as far as price, legality, or anything like that, what would it be and why? One reptile? I mean, you can have several, but like, what, what would it be? If, if I didn't have to worry about price, I would definitely open a herpetarium. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's, that's the dream, right? dream, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Just, so yep. if I could have one reptile that... um. With you know no you know space size money legality, I would have yeah. an extremely large enclosed tropical rainforest for nothing but Komodo dragons. <laughs> because, okay, just have and this is Komodo probably dragon one of the room. <laughs> and and I'm not a big lizard guy. I'm a snake yeah. guy. But when I was a little kid, I saw a cartoon, a Johnny Quest cartoon, and they had a big giant thing with Komodo dragons in it, and I thought. That is what I want. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I just, hey. anytime I see a Komodo dragon, uh, that's exactly what I think of. And it just takes me back to when I was a kid. And I remember laying tape out on the floor when I found out Komodo dragons get 10 feet long. And I said, <laughs> and I, I measured, I measured it out. And I told my mom, this is how big Komodo dragons get. And she said, you're not getting a Komodo dragon. <laughs> <laughs> Way to kill, but why, way to kill the dream right now. <laughs> like you know, we can talk about yeah. what they do, you know. Uh, God, that's great. All right. So uh if you could go herping anywhere in the world, where would you want to go and what would you be hoping to see? Um, to be honest, anywhere, but if I had to say somewhere right now, mm. like I said before, I would really like to get a feel for Halmahera and see 
and the islands around it. Mm-hmm. If, if there's other animals there, um, I would love to see if there's variations and patterns that we're seeing here in captivity are, you know, different populations or groups in, uh, in, you know, on the Island. And I just think that would be really cool. Uh, yeah. My second would be rough scales in 2023 20, with you guys. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're going to be a big helicopter, dude. <laughs> like <it's>, uh, <laughs> just dropping a little hint there. Yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> I'm supposed to go to Africa next year. I'm not sure if it's going to happen, but dude. Uh, I was supposed to go last year and it didn't happen because of COVID. Mm, and right. yeah. So getting cancer one year and COVID the next year has put Africa off several years. So, yeah. But that, gotcha. that, you know, that's the problem is like, I'm still an animal guy too. Like I would probably really dig going to Africa too, just because maybe not all the reptile stuff, because, you know, it's not my niche, niche, whatever yeah. nipper feels like saying. Um, but still like, you know, African elephants, lions, stuff like that. I, I'd probably be all about that. So. Well, so uh, the reason I would be going is because a friend of mine is a professor at the University of Wyoming. He has a field mm-hmm. station there cool. and they do they do research on Cape hunting dogs and um, lions and nice some little mouse. And he was like, come on over. So hopefully nice. I'll be, be getting there. So that's cool. Avoid mambas. So yeah, <laughs> that, that would be cool. So um, will you be adding anything to your collection this year? And what will it be? Um, I think I'm supposed to be getting a male Halmahera python here pretty soon. But Oh, another one. Yeah, that's I'm cool. not sure. Nice. Um, if I can talk Chuck Poland out of a couple of his babies, <laughs> maybe he'll trade me. Or I think I heard on the Fight Club that he's ready to sort of. I, part I with thought I heard something with that. Yeah. yeah. Strike while the iron's hot, man. Yeah, quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, before he changes I, his mind, I figure I might have an edge if uh, he's willing to do some trading. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, I, because that's I, awesome. I I love to make you know money enough to do this, but. Mm-hmm. I'll trade anybody anything if I want something because that's, you know, that's where I'm from. When I first went to my first reptile show, that's how we did it, right? Yeah. Stuff. yeah, it was. Yeah. There were six tables and a bunch of deli cups from guys that had stuff in their basement, and it was like, you know, I'll swap my D'Alberts pythons with your ring pythons, and we just traded. So, yeah. Um, Damn it! I wish I'm you were down for trades, especially, <laughs> especially like I said, we're in the we're in the foothills of this. Helma Hera thing, and I'd yeah. like to do it right. So, yeah, yeah. very cool. Well, I need to get. That's why I need to get my team uh, going. I need clout. Don't tell my <laughs> don't tell my wife I'm adding anything. I mean, unless she's a regular won't. listen to the show. <laughs> <laughs> ah, shit, she, she is, and that's why we screwed. say this at the end uh, because not, typically the wife anything. will listen at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, oh, not, that's not great. You're not a thing. Yeah. yeah. I, I love how I asked that question, and then it's like, yeah, will you be adding anything, and what will it be? Like, I I, I already know you are, so what is it? <laughs> like, it's, right. yeah, she's not dumb. When I take when I take off work and tell her I got to run to the FedEx hub, she knows something's on its way. Yeah, I had to do that today. So <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the one time we actually go to FedEx and come back with like I don't know, like I, like paper or something, like a box and no snake. Wouldn't it feel weird? Like or it's, a present for her. <laughs> oh, look, it's for you. Yeah. <laughs> throw, throw them all. You. <laughs> I've never, never done that. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know FedEx delivered other things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just thought that they were the Wait, reptile they, cure. They don't just do snakes. This is weird. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, and then do you have any kind of website, social media stuff, anything else you want to throw out there for anybody to try to get in contact with you? Uh, mostly just don't contact you yet. Yeah, don't contact you yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not yet. <laughs> Leave you alone. All right. <laughs> no, it's you're gonna cool. get an influx in your inbox. It's like, hey, man. <laughs> how many? How many yeah. people have approached you about baby Helma Harris who you wouldn't sell them a corn snake? Because I guarantee you, there have to be like a million people. You know, honestly, not that many. Um, mm-hmm. Some of the people that have approached me, I don't know. Obviously, right, um, right. Blake has hinted around several times, which, you know, he already knows he's got his foot in the door. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but I haven't had, honestly, that many. Um, I, 
I have more contact. I have more people contact me about Savu pythons than I do uh, have that I have the hounds. Um, wow. Well, you better get ready, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know, I'll just say now I'm not selling any of the hounds. There you go. Not, yeah. Not for a while. But right. There you go. Oh, shoot. I forgot what I was going to say. Um, You're saying about they contact you about the Savus? Yeah. yeah, they contact me about the Savus. was something before that. Sorry. Oh. I just drew a blank. I'm sorry. <laughs> any, any social media or anything like that you want to tell oh. us about? Um, so. I'm a very, like, when Eric, when I met you at Tinley Park, it took every bit of courage that I had to come up and talk to you because I'm a very quiet person. I usually stand there yeah. quiet and say nothing. However, right. that being said, I'm very approachable. So if anyone sees me at anything or show and you want to talk snakes, I love to do that. So just come up and talk to me about snakes. And, um, you know, I don't – I have Facebook – um, and you can get me on messenger on there. A uh, few people know, um, my email address is WL Python one at att.net. And the reason it's that is because I bred white lip pythons for the first, that was the first snake I bred. And that was right. my handle on Morelia Python. Um, first snake, what the hell? Forum. <laughs> forums. Yeah. yeah. Um, which in my defense, because I've heard several people say, why do people use different handles than their names? It's I thought that's what you did back in the 90s when that started. <laughs> so did I. I. Mean, yeah, what? <laughs> use, a, use a cool handle. You know, yeah. like, it's the whole point, nuts man. 182 or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say uh, masterful poopsie is probably the best. <laughs> <laughs> You always knew who the big players were MP on MP joke. because the the MP guys like Nick Mutton was only ever known as Nick Mutton, <laughs> but right. like it, so yeah. Well, and didn't he always have like his little uh, what do you call it the emoji his or little, his little icon was some dude? The screaming, avatar wasn't it was it? punching, yeah. right? Yeah, it was somebody <laughs> punching somebody. He's like, I don't want to talk to that guy. I don't want to talk to I that said guy. The same thing. <laughs> the guy's I crazy. said the same thing. <laughs> oh my gosh! I'm like, wow, that guy's mad. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I'll say when I, when I did first, so on that forum is when mm. I first discovered the Helms back in the day. And mm. I, I did talk to Jim Kronoski, Kronoski. Yeah. Yeah. I did talk to him. Oh, Kuro- uh, yeah. 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 Kuroski. The guy, yeah. Kuroski, yeah. I did talk to him uh, a few times or quite a bit when I first started looking and um, stuff like that. And actually me and him were, cause he was getting some Helms at the time and, it was kind of like someone would post on Facebook, Hey, there's a helm here. And I would rush to, you know, Bushmaster or whatever and say, send it to me. And he's like, Oh, somebody already got it. <laughs> and then Jim would be like, Hey, look what I just got from Bushmaster. I hate that. Son of a bitch. That happened. That happened with me with white lips. So many yeah. freaking times. It was a race. So. <clears throat> yep. Yep. Cool. Well, thank you, man. Oh, yeah, uh, this has been awesome. I uh, appreciate you taking the time and coming on and sharing your experiences with us and uh, wish you nothing but the best of luck yeah. going forward with the, yeah. with the project. And uh, well, I appreciate congrats, it. man. I mean, first yeah. of many clutches. Major hopefully. congrats. Yeah. You know? Thank you. So, Like I said, it's awesome. I'd love to start a stud book or something. So if anybody that has any captive animals, you know, just send me, I have a male and this is where I got it or a female and this is where I got it. I don't need any other information. I'm just curious to know what we've got out there. So if anybody wants yeah. to send me some information, I'll try and work up something a way that we can keep, kind of keep track of it. But, but I appreciate it. I'm super flattered to be on here and I hope I don't sound totally ridiculous. But uh, nah, man, you said everything was great. I yeah, do man. on a weekly basis, and we somehow keep going. So yeah. Well, I, I can I don't tell you have, this: when I'm listening, have, oh, go ahead. Uh, I don't have the wit of Owen McIntyre or Gary Scavino, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> not usually, many people do. I don't have the wit of Gary Scavino. I mean, usually come on. I can come up with pretty smart ass stuff if I need to. That <laughs> I mean, I made a career out of it apparently so um yeah but no, i was gonna say as we're going through uh you know i i make i make notes of like go back and listen to this right go back mm-hmm. and listen to this go back and listen to this i've made quite a few notes during this because you you come up with the humidity thing really uh yeah i wrote that intrigues me man so uh 
Yeah. Good stuff, man. Tons and tons of good stuff. So thank you so much for uh, for for coming on. Yeah, no we really appreciate it. Yeah. All right. All right. We'll, catch, we'll catch up with you down the road with some other cool stuff, hopefully. Okay. Yep. I'll come back on <laughs> right next on. time I get another clutch of helms. Yeah, Done. man. Absolutely. Yeah, open right. open door. All right. All right. Thanks, Shane. Thanks, guys. Um, <clears throat> all right. That was uh as an awesome episode and uh major congrats to Shane. Um like I said at the beginning of the show, breeding Halma Harris scrubs was uh was a was a pipe dream for for a lot of us back in the MP days and for him yeah. to go full circle with it and uh that's pretty awesome and uh major congrats to him. So uh, yeah, awesome. It, it it was it went from something that was never gonna happen to we have you know, it's one of those things where like a zoo breeding happens and you're like, oh, cool. That that's cool that a zoo did it. And then a European breeding happens and you're like, oh, well, that's all right. But then two United States clutches in private hands. You're like, holy shit. Yeah. All right. That's good. So, yeah. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. Um, And, you know, the. Uh, you know. Oh, shit. I totally lost my train. of thought. <laughs> mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Yeah. That happens. If it helps, oh, would, it help, would it help if I, if I, if it help, would help if I speak like Nipper? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Now I, I feel hello, more, Gary, uh, more would that be, yeah. Can you um, end the show now? No, I was going to say that the humidity, uh, the humidity that, thing was that, very, very intriguing. That's messing me up because now all I can think about is that I wrote down, what is it, the hydro stat at 55%. I'm like, Dude, really? You okay. got to get that. That's yeah. The- that is the Did key you to your, That's the your key collection. To everything. All of a sudden, all the Indo shit is breeding. I need that 55 be great? To great. Like, yeah. Imagine if like I, I put the hydrometer down and it's like 53 degrees. And then I use a humidifier to bump it up to 55 and then everything lays eggs. Yeah. Wouldn't that be I'd nuts? Quit. I'd quit out of rage. Man, I've been doing yeah. this for 11 years. <laughs> Fucking pieces of shit, all of you. Yeah. Ah, but at least you got to figure it out. Um, yeah, yeah. It, I'd be angry for a little bit, but then eggs would start coming, and I'd be okay. So <laughs> awesome. So yeah, I mean, I guess for us, uh, uh, I guess we'll uh, we'll call it. Um, you know, I I keep looking over here as Stop we're doing the show. Freaking lizards! Will you focus on the show? But then the kid, you can play with the lizards. I, I just got to give a shout out to Mike Mike Stefani from Mike's Monitors. Uh, you know, I I say all the time about how when you buy an animal from a breeder, mm. the difference between buying an animal at a show just from a, you know, from somebody as opposed to an animal that's special to you, and you're getting it from a breeder and something mm-hmm. that maybe you haven't worked with before. And it can be sort of intimidating, I guess, if you will. And yeah. um, when you have that sort of person that you can rely on and throw questions at and, and, and everything, it sort of really makes a difference. And, uh, yeah, man, he's that kind of guy. So if you're interested in monitors of, of any type, uh, you know, especially like the dwarfs or, uh, if you want to go crazy and get some Mertens or something like that, the coming eye, some all that ones, stuff. Yeah. Um, but, uh, dude, he's, he's been, he's been awesome every step of the way. Um, so, uh, you know, I felt bad because I I went to, uh, so I had store inventory today, and then I had to leave mm-hmm. and go pick it up, pick it up, and um, I got stuck in traffic, and he's uh. like, he was text, so I when I get in the thing, my phone goes on to do not disturb, so I don't yeah. get texts and stuff, so uh, <clears throat> he was texting me the whole time, and and I finally I get to the uh, FedEx spot. And I'm mm. looking at it and I was like, oh, shit. Yeah, I'm getting him right now, man. But he's, you know, yeah. I, obviously he's concerned that uh, make sure. Right. That, he went, uh, dude, I sent out a baby carpet. Um, I had to delay some shipments to California because of further delays through FedEx. But I sent a baby from PA to New Jersey and it was at the FedEx hub. And I, like the entire time I'm like pick up the baby <laughs> like it's like, yeah. please pick up the baby i know it's fine i know you're fine everything please just just yeah. pick it up and verify that you got it that's all right. i want and yeah right. so so uh 
I, yeah, I can't say good uh, enough good things about him. And, and see, and like even tonight, already I had a question, um, you know, and I, I, I sent him a message or whatever, and he's kind of going back and forth with me. And he sent me a video of like showing me exactly how he sets yeah. his cage and whatnot. And I was like, yeah. I'm I'm it. sure that all the miniature Owens, as I have named them, um, <laughs> will will do very well in their cages. It's uh, it's Owen Jr., Owen the Third, and Owen Lord of the Kimberly. That's so my favorite. Yeah, he is. Yeah, of course, that's an official title. Yeah. So I'm sure all three of those little Owens will do very well. Yeah. So yeah. Owen, I'm helping. I guess so. uh, Owen Lord of the Kimberly is at the top of the cage. Yeah, of course it is. You have, <laughs> survey the realm i mean come on yeah. yeah but uh yeah man i couldn't be more excited to have kimberly rocks like what the Dude, hell yeah. I'm, I'm, so gl- I'm so glad I, i'm so glad they weren't there when i went to see you because i would have been like all right these things are badass and you know now we're ditching more snakes to make room for monitors oh my so, god man yeah, yeah. and they're dwarfs yeah. so it's like what Dude, the can hell you imagine you know, if I didn't have these fucking rhinos, I could do that in the middle of the room tank. I mean, in the living room tank. But oh man, you know, yeah, dude, you come here and see them, you're gonna, you're gonna I, lose your shit. I don't want to. So I know that cool. because there, if there was ever one that I would possibly get into, it's always been Kimberly's. So uh, I don't oh, want to see really. Them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The long tails, oh and the long heads. Yeah. Yep. And they're so inquisitive as opposed it's, to the Acnes, You know. Yeah. Very cool. Yep. It was, I, I kind of, when I, when I got to see, uh, Brian's, um, Belfast lace monitors, Mm -hmm. they were really badass and really cool. So then after that, shortly after that is I saw the first Kimmy's and I'm like, Mm -hmm. okay, it's like a miniature one. (laughs) Like it's, and then you kind of start realizing what was really cool about the Kimberly rocks. So they've always been those ones that like, if I was ever going to do, it'd be those, but (sighs) yeah, that's cool, man. Oh man. No. Yeah. Where no. do you see them? Uh, no. So uh yeah, I'm already I'm already looking at designing their next enclosure. <laughs> like yeah, you know, step them up, you know. Next right. one up, baby. <laughs> yeah. So uh all right. So that's what's going on here. And um I guess if you want to see what we have going on, you can check out our website, moreliapythonradio.com or .net. Either one will take you to it. Our email is info at moreliapythonradio.com. If you have any questions, comments, uh, you know. If you are interested concerns. in hearing specific, yeah, or concerns, um, specific, yeah. you know, topic or whatever the case would be, uh, just be sure to uh, hit us up and um, we will uh, get back to you. Uh, yep. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, uh, yes. MTR Network. Um, we have some videos I, that will be popping up there. I just booked my flight to Arizona nice. in October where I will be herping with the group is constantly growing. So it's, I know Rob, I know Justin, they're talking about hanging out, uh, with, 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 um, Frank Reitz. Frank Reitz. I'm like, okay, so there's a lot here. Yeah. So I will have the GoPro attached to my chest, like Iron Man. And yes. that'll be like Owen vision. So we'll Owen have vision. a lot of footage for that kind of stuff. And we'll check out all the stuff we have going on there. Um, I have to just shotgun a ton of Simpsons stuff. Otherwise, Justin won't want to speak to me. So, yes, um, yes. yeah. Yep. Chop, chop. So Let's hopefully going. I'm going to be able to go. You know, I yeah, got some dude. family stuff going on and it's mm-hmm. going to be last minute for me. But, uh, yeah, hopefully. Uh, it's not as there. expensive as I was expecting. No? No. Okay. Very cool. That's not bad. No. Yeah. Okay. So. Very cool. Um, so uh, the one, and if you want to support the show, here's a couple ways that you can do that. One, you can um, you can share it, you can like it, yeah. you can subscribe yeah. to it, uh, or mm-hmm. all the shows on the network. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel, all that stuff. Um, and you can um, also, if you want to take it a step further, you can go over and check out our Teespring store. We have some merch over there. I just added all of the logos of all the. Uh, you could have podcast. an entire NPR podcast coffee mug collection. Yes. You don't have to drink out of a boring coffee mug uh, ever again. Yes. I figured we'd start with the coffee mugs, right? Yep. Because we'll move on to other things. coffee. And then Duh. we'll move on to uh, to shirts with Owen's witty sayings on it and all yep. kinds of stuff. So I, I apparently have many. <clears throat> you do. Weird. Yeah. You do. Yes. <laughs> you witty son of a bitch. Yeah, uh, <laughs> this will be brought up again. We'll we'll take t-shirt sales into uh 
you know, into the contract negotiations that we're going to have later on. Yes, so, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, um, of course. And, uh, you know, how could I forget? The calendar contest is, is it's all going. Live. <laughs> it's yeah. up. It's live. It, if you, It's going to be fucking difficult. Yes. <laughs> it's like, you oh guys are up in the game. God. I love it. I don't think I see a single categories is going to be a freaking walk in the park this year. Like no. every single one, the worst one, the worst one is going to be the monitors. Yes. You, you fucked us. Like it is, <laughs> yes. it is going to be bad, man. And Scott Iper just posted up. I know <laughs> my favorite uh, monitor in the whole entire like, world like, of I mean, all time. I'm like, Oh, that's awesome. Oh, that's awesome. And then Scott drops a freaking baby perenny coming out of an egg. What like, the hell? I mean, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Nipper messaged me and he's like, should I even waste my time? Should don't I waste even, my day I, off? Not even, don't even do it. <laughs> I was like, come and on, there's man. something else. It's, come on, dude. I was like, like no, just, you got to take some shots of your, your stuff. He's like fucking yeah. heavyweights just pounding each other. <sighs> it's awesome. Very cool. Yeah. So you have until when, when Owen, when does it October cut off? First. We okay. are going to cut off October 1st because then you and I will decide uh, we're going to thin down to our picks and then we will have you, me and Terry vote on the winners and then we'll announce those on NPR. So uh, October 1st, you have from now to October 1st, you have so much time. It's ridiculous to go through all your pictures, to take pictures of some animals, to maybe do something nice outside. Now there was some confusion. We said no tub shots. What we're saying is, Please don't submit a picture of an animal on newspaper inside its tub. If you wanted to put it in a, uh, a light box or something like that, that's cool. If you wanted to put it on some kind of cool background, that's fine. If you want to take it outside, that's fine too. You don't have to take it outside. Just Mm -hmm. some nice photo of it, not on newspaper in its cage. If the cage itself is planted in a really nice terrarium, do it there. That's fine too. All right. That's hundred percent. Okay. Calendar quality <clears throat> photos, guys. That's right. all we're looking for. Yep. Um. So you win. If you win, if you are picked for one of the months, uh, you get a yep. free calendar. And if you are uh, yep. the winner of, uh, we call it morality of the year, uh, you get to come it's back and judge the, the next. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> We've, it, it's it been a been morality, but, uh, <laughs> it's like, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, uh, we're Morelia we, Python Radio, so it is whatever. whatever. Yeah, that's Everybody what happens. Knows. So, like, if you're best in show, you get to come back and you get to vote next year and help us choose the winners. So, yes. Yeah. There which you go. is cool. And we're yep. trying to think of a, a nice little addition that maybe we could get. I know right. We had some now, ideas with that. We were also going to throw around that if you are the winner of Morelia of the Year, you get to pick the category. Yes. The, the special category, because now we have the 12th month of the year is always whatever we choose. Right. So this year is monitors next year. It will be Morelia of the year's choice. Right. So, so the, you get to choose what that's going to be. Call your Brits, boas, turtles, whatever, whatever. Yeah. Reptile related. Yes. It has to be that. a reptile. Yeah. <laughs> you could be a complete dick and say ball pythons and we'll have to do it. Ball pythons with hats. I'll, I will hate. Oh my god! Hog noses with mustaches. No, 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 no. I, I immediately regret this and retract everything. Kimberly, no. Kimberly rocks with a top with hat. hat. How many monocles can you put on a hog nose? <laughs> oh dear! Oh dear! Oh dear! Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Now um, I don't want it anymore. So <laughs> that went south quickly. That went that went quickly. Yeah. So we got the calendar contest going on, and uh, yeah, uh, so we got that, and uh, you know, as soon as we get it done, printed, all that kind of stuff, we uh, we will uh, we will be setting them out, have them up yep. for sale, all that kind of stuff, and uh, you know, I guess last but not least, if you uh, want to support us uh, in the next step, uh, I guess it would be Patreon. You can go and join mm-hmm. the Patreon helps uh pay for the stuff that we do and uh yeah um yep and you also get to go and uh <clears throat> join us for a monthly private show with just the patrons where we answer questions we talk about uh, yeah you know, we even throw out ideas that we're thinking about for the podcast of the stuff because that's what we talked about a lot this last one was yeah you know it was almost a state of the podcast kind of a yeah. deal like it was a lot of people so, were like what <laughs> what yeah we 
we shocked a lot of people. Eric started yeah. talking, and I'm like, and this will be the last show. Uh-huh. So, yeah, that was yeah. – um, no, so we'll do that. I mean, so th- there's a lot kind of stuff with that. It's it's cool to join, and we are thinking of new ideas uh, for new tiers for people to join, so we'll get that going for you guys too. Yeah. Yep. So uh, that's all I got. That's all we have for you, everybody, tonight. So we'll say thank you all for listening, and we'll catch everybody back here next week for some more Morelia Python radio. Mm-hmm.